Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Mann, and on behalf of the mayor, I will be chairing today's special council meeting. We're, we're meeting virtually today, as we have been for the past year. I want to take this time to remind all of us, community and council included, to use respectful language, and the words and the tone do matter in council meetings, in other discussions, and on social media. As of April 8th, the province has issued a stay-at-home order, and just yesterday announced that schools will remain online after the March break, which is this week. On behalf of council and staff, we understand the fatigue we are all feeling after over a year of the pandemic. We understand the frustration. However, we cannot stress enough how important it is that we all continue to do our part. I want to extend a sincere thanks to our hospital staff, frontline and essential workers. Our healthcare system is in a delicate situation right now. And it's important to recognize many people have had to pivot to care for COVID patients across the province. Our teachers and essential workers have also adapted time after time. And we are extremely grateful for all of them. Let's remember to be kind to one another and do everything to keep ourselves safe and healthy, both physically and mentally. We don't always know or recognize the stress and toll this takes on us. So a smile to a stranger can go a long way. The stay at home order requires residents to remain at home except for essential purposes. As the weather improves, you will see our staff out at the parks to remind you of the rules. They are there to protect all of us and help to stop the spread. As our Mayor Catherine McGarry recently mentioned, she is absent for today's meeting as she is having surgery and needs time to recover. On behalf of Council, we want to wish her a speedy recovery and we want her to know that we will be thinking of her during these difficult days. I'd like to remind everyone that as a result of social distancing guidelines being in place, in-person public consultation or attendance at special meetings of council is not currently available. However, procedures for electronic participation during the course of an emergency allow for the public to provide written submissions to the city clerk's office in advance of the meeting for items on the agenda and to also call in via telephone to our virtual meeting. So now we will move into our agenda. And first I will ask the clerk to complete a roll call of council so that we can confirm everyone's attendance as we are coming to you electronically today. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. Present. Councillor Devine. Present. Councillor Meta. Present. Councillor Hamilton. Present. Councillor Liggett will join us shortly. Councillor Reed. Present. Councillor Wolf. Present. Deputy Mayor Mann. Present. Thank you. And in addition, we are going to take a moment to welcome the staff we have joining us today. And joining us electronically, we have our city manager, David Calder. Our deputy city managers, Hardy Bromberg. Cheryl Zahnleiter, Yogesh Shaw, and Dave Bush. Our Chief Financial Officer, Cheryl Ayers. Our City Solicitor, Lisa Shields. Our Chief Planner, Elaine Brumshaw. Our Director of Engineering, Kevin DeLebeck. Our Director of Operations, Mike Hauser. We also have staff from other divisions joining us this evening and they will join the meeting when their item is up for discussion. And clerking the meeting today, we have our city clerk, Danielle Manton, our deputy city clerk, Jennifer Shaw, and Briar Allison, council committee services coordinator. And again, thanks today to our technical services staff, Greg Elgie, who is assisting with logistics for this meeting.
And now a reminder to members of council that Municipal Conflict of Interest Act requires members of council to, to declare any direct or indirect pecuniary interest in relation to a matter under consideration. So to council, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? And seeing none, we will move forward with our agenda for today's meeting. First up, we have Jamie Griffs from the Idea Exchange, who will provide us with a presentation on the results of the celebration of women's events held in October. In October. And if you just bear with us, we'll uh, get Jamie on the line. Good afternoon, Jamie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, Ed, can I start my presentation now? In, in just in just one moment. Uh, okay. But again, thank you for joining us. I understand you have a presentation, and we'll just have our clerk share the screen to see your presentation and request when you finish for us, just ask us to advance the slide, and the clerk will Perfect. do that. Please note that there is a delay on the YouTube, so please let us know when you are finished speaking to each slide and we'll move forward. Hey, thank you. This floor is yours, Jamie. Okay, thank you so much, Honorable Mayor, City Council. Thank you, City of Cambridge and Councillor Reed for the invitation to come and present tonight on the celebration of women virtual events at Idea Exchange. To mark Persons Day and Women's History Month in October, Idea Exchange hosted three virtual online programs and events. Persons Day in Canada marks the day in 1929 when the historic decision to include women in the legal definition of persons was handed down by Canada's highest court of appeal. This gave women the right to be appointed to the Senate of Canada and paved the way for women's increased participation in public and political life. We wanted to showcase and celebrate a diverse range of ages, identities, and experiences of women in our community. Next slide, please. The first event was Women in Song, a concert that included women representing diverse perspectives and experiences and different styles of music. Hosted by Coral Andrews from CKWR, the concert featured musical artists Maya Gomez, Jody Narita, Sarah McGrath, Karen Argo, and Transstar. Videos were submitted by each musician in advance and edited together into a seamless presentation by staff in the old post office's creative studios. We were also able to film Councillor Reed on location at the old post office so that she could speak to the context of Persons Day and send her greetings at the beginning of the event. Next slide, please. The second program was a Rise to Thrive workshop with wellness coach Erin Morahan. Her topic focused on not being afraid of failure and in fact, learning from failure to thrive in life and in leadership. Erin used real life examples as an entrepreneur to inspire us all to embrace setbacks as tools for growth. Next slide, please. Our last virtual event in the series was an evening and Q&A with best-selling author Alka Joshi. Her debut novel, The Henna Artist, became a New York Times bestseller, a Reese Witherspoon book club pick, a top 10 Goodreads book of 2020, and is currently being developed into a TV series. The determination of women to transform their lives and make something of their gifts is a theme that permeates Joshi's novel. Next slide, please. In conclusion, one year ago this month, ID Exchange had never done any virtual programming or events. Over the course of 2020, ID Exchange staff and management pushed this necessary shift to online programming. And as a result, we saw over a 93% increase in attendance to our adult events. We reached new audiences virtually who may, could not access our physical spaces or did not have the means to travel to a location and sometimes our locations were temporarily closed. The total participation for our three Celebration of Women virtual events was over 1,400 people, 
had attended via Zoom or watched on Facebook Live. Again, lastly, just wanted to say a giant thank you, Councillor Reed and the City of Cambridge for your generous grant support for the Celebration of Women program series at ID Exchange. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, and what a very exciting time for uh, for this celebration in Cambridge. And now I turn to Council and ask, are there any questions from Council? And we do have some. First off is uh, Councillor Reed. Oh, Go mine ahead, isn't a question, it's a comment. So would you like me to wait? No, you were, the, you were the first with your hand up. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to say thank you to Jamie and, and to the Idea Exchange for partnering uh, with the city in pro providing these programs. Uh, I'm sure that many of you uh, took advantage of them as I did, and I really enjoyed each one for what they offered to our community. So thanks once again to the Idea Exchange. Thank you, Councillor Reed. And uh, seeing no further questions, again, Jamie, we just want to thank you and congratulate you on uh, taking this initiative and doing it virtually and having such a great audience for your three events. Thank you again uh, for, you, for uh, celebrating our women in our community. You are welcome to follow the remainder of the meeting on the City of Cambridge YouTube channel if you like. And we were grateful to have you here this evening. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is related to the City of Cambridge and the Canadian Award for Financial Reporting. And we have our Chief Financial Officer with us this evening, Cheryl Ayers. And I will turn it over to Cheryl to speak to this item. Cheryl. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Mann, and to members of Council and the public who are watching online today. I'm pleased to be able to share the exciting news with you this evening that the City of Cambridge has received the Canadian Award for Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association, or the GFOA, for the fifth year in a row. With this award, the GFOA recognizes local governments who go beyond the minimum requirements of generally accepted accounting principles to prepare a comprehensive annual financial report that embodies the spirit of transparency and full disclosure. As you're aware, one of the objectives included in the city's strategic plan is to focus on the responsible management of financial resources, ensuring transparency and accountability. Being honored with this award is recognition of the city's commitment to this objective. I'd like to thank all the staff in uh, the finance team for their continued dedication to the work we do, and particularly the leadership of Katie Fisher and Myrna Raponi in the responsible preparation of the city's financial statements and Myrna's efforts to prepare the annual financial report that was submitted for this award. So thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And a special thanks to our finance branch. And before we move on, are there any questions or comments from Council in relation to this uh, prestigious award that we have won yet again. And seeing none, I just want to uh, say a special thanks again to you and your staff who continually demonstrate their commitment and dedication to financial excellence in our community, especially during these unprecedented times. The fifth year in a row that we have received this award, it speaks so well of the commitment of our staff. And I just wanna say thank you, a sincere thank you to you and your team for all the hard work that you have done. Thank you. And moving on to our, our uh, consent agenda and the first item for consideration this evening is the consent agenda. And I would like to note that if a member of council wishes to comment, on any of the consent items, please let us know by using your raised hand feature. And in the interest of time, we will look to vote on the consent procedure in a block. But if you do wish to comment, you're more than welcome to do so. And Councillor Wolf, I believe you have the motion. Would you please read it in its entirety? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Adshade, recommendation that all items listed under the heading of consent agenda for Tuesday, April 13th, 
2021 Council Agenda be adopted as recommended. 6.2 Special Council Minutes, March 30th, 2021. 6.2 Council Information Package, April 1st, 2021. 6.3 Cambridge Accessibility Advisory Committee Minutes, February 22nd, 2021. 6.4 Economic Development Advisory Committee Minutes, January 13th, 2021. 6.5 21-085-CD 50 Lansdowne Road South. 6.6 21-022-CRS Development Charges Statement for the year ended December 21st, 2020. 6.7 21-039-CRS 2020 Year End Operating Update. 6.8 21-079-CD 7 Queen Square Central Presbyterian Church Request for Funding from the Heritage Conservation Reserve Fund. 6.9 21-112 CRS T21-03 Dover Street Sanitary Pump Station Upgrade 6.1021-090 IFS Capital Status and Forecast Report 6.1121-135 CRS Fire Safety Grant from the Office of the Fire Marshal and 6.12 Striking Committee Appointments, April 12th, 2021. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor Wolf. And does any member of council wish to pull any item from the consent agenda? Are there any questions for staff? Does council have any comments? All right, then I will now ask for the clerk to call for the vote. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Hey. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. That carries. Thank you. Next, we will now move into our consideration of reports. And up first is agenda item number 7.1.1. Uh, this item is 21-064 uh, CRS Community Grants. We do have pre-registered delegations on this item. And tonight we have four delegations wishing to speak. Our first delegation is Dr. Lori. Healthy Heart Day 17, and we'll take a moment to get Dr. Laurie on the line. To our consideration of reports, and up first is agenda item number 7.1.1. Uh, this item is 21-064 uh, CRS Community Grants. Dr. Laurie, uh, we do have Dr. Laurie, three Dr. delegations Laurie. on this item. We have four delegations. Dr. Laurie is on this speak. line. If you want to call him directly, there's another line. Dr. Laurie, Dr. Dr. Laurie, hear you. Dr. Laurie please turn the volume down. We'll take a moment to get Dr. Laurie on the line. Thank you. Dr. Laurie, can you turn the volume down on your YouTube? Reports. And up first is agenda item. I am not on YouTube. Uh, this item. Can you turn the volume down in the background, please? Okay, I think we're ready. Good afternoon, Dr. Laurie. It's uh, Councillor Mike Mann. Thank you for joining us today to be a delegate. And before you get started, there are just some guidelines that I'd like to explain. Thank you. As a reminder, you have five minutes to address council. And please ensure that your comments and remarks relate directly to the agenda item you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your remarks. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure your comments and remarks are respectful 
and that you retain from asking questions of counsel. A reminder to ensure your comments are directly related to the item you are speaking to. I'll advise you when your five minutes are up, at which time counsel may have questions. So again, thank you for joining us, Dr. Lurie, and you're welcome to begin your presentation. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Mann and uh, um, members of council. I'm here on behalf of Healthy Heart Day, uh, and I am wanting to request reconsideration of grants to groups for the amount requested this year of $8,000. There were two points that were raised in the concern uh, raised by the city, uh, and we want to say uh, categorically that none of the money raised by our organization goes back to a charitable concern. Uh, and this was an issue that um, arose because Dr. Andrew Pipe, one of our leading speakers uh, this year, who is the chair of the Heart and Stroke Society of Canada, um, donated his speaker fee back to his charity. That was not directly from us, that was his choice. Uh, so it was a personal uh, donation, as well as our co-chair, Michelle Pandy, made a personal donation to the Heart and Stroke Society. None of the funds raised by our organization went uh, to these concerns. By way of, uh, of con concept here, I just wanted to outline what Healthy Heart Day is about. And so I would like to refer to my slides, Healthy Heart Day, 17. This is a program Thank you, that Doc, has been running Doc, for... Dr. Laurie, what I'll yeah. do is I'll just ask that as you go through your slide presentation, and I'm sorry for interrupting, please just be aware that there is a delay, but as you go through the slide presentation, advise the clerk and we'll advance to the next slide for you. Yeah. So Thank you. Healthy Heart Day 17. Thank you. Uh, could we go to the second slide? So this is a free event to the public. Um, and is of general interest to a lot of people, uh, young and old. The focus is on heart health prevention, detection, and treatment. This is our 17th year that is coming up, and in our preparation for this year, we already have 560 people registered. We bring in medical and health experts uh, with a new theme each year. This year's theme is Take Control of Your Health, Body, Mind, and Spirit. Uh, last year, we live streamed and rebroadcast our presentation uh, at least six times, and we felt that we have reached over 8,000 people with last year's presentation. Next slide, please. We have a dedicated committee of volunteers that work all year to bring this event to the public, and um, several members of council and the mayor often would um, attend this event. It's a half-day event. Um, with many uh, different and diverse people uh, presenting. Next slide, please. How is it financed? We have many sponsors uh, and the pharma industry has been um, very supportive. However, this year and in this economy, um, the pharma industries are, are lagging as well. Uh, we do have media sponsors and there are other um, sponsors such as the Heart and Stroke Society and Cambridge Cardiac Rehab. Could we have the next slide, please? Our expenses um, for the first 15 years, we did have a venue expense, AD technical support, and speakers fees. As I said, we bring in some national and internationally known speakers to Cambridge for this event. Um, we also have promotion and advertising, and every year the Cambridge Cardiac Care uh, Clinic uh, has underwritten at least part of that um, expense to make it happen. But to repeat what I had said earlier, this never turns a profit. Next slide, please. The two areas of misunderstanding, Dr. Andrew Pipe wanted his fees donated to the Heart and Stroke Society, so his speaker fee, which was designated for him, was uh, switched and transferred over to a charitable donation. That was his concern to support his charity, uh, of which he is the chair. Michelle Pandy, who is our co-chair, um, made a personal donation to the Heart and Stroke Society as well. And again, none of this money came from the funds that had been raised. The Heart, the, um, <clears throat> the, 
Healthy Heart Day is very appreciative of the city having supported us for many years to three, four, five, and eight thousand uh, dollars. And without that support, this event would not be viable. The next slide um, that just summarizes um, our, our basic finances. We have a committee of 15 people, all volunteer, that work all year to bring this free event. So once again, the misunderstanding on um, money being directed um, to charitable cause that we had raised was based on a misunderstanding. And I think I've, I've clarified that with the two donations that were specifically directed to the Heart and Stroke Society. That concludes my comments. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Laurie, and thank you for that uh, explanation in relation to the, uh, the donation. Uh, to, uh, to Council, are there any questions of uh, Dr. Laurie? I, I do see one for you, Dr. Laurie, and uh, that is from Councillor Reed. Councillor Reed, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, uh, I'm wondering, Dr. Laurie, what did we provide last year in the way of funding to you? I believe it was $8,000. Yep. No, it wasn't $8,000. Okay, was $4,000. It was $4,000. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. $4,000. Four thousand. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. And are there any other questions for Dr. Laurie? Well, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Laurie, and you're more than welcome to continue listening on YouTube while we continue with this uh, section of our of our meeting this evening. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, Man, and Council. Our next delegation is Adjeroni Evie from Kind Minds Family. We will take a moment to get them on the line. And if you just bear with us, we're still trying to get the individual on the line. Uh, Hello? Adjeroni? Yes, Adjeroni, good evening. Good evening, and uh, I hope I have your name right. And just before we get started, I have a couple of comments that I'll make, and then we'll let you get started, okay? Sounds good, thank you. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, Councillor Mike Mann, and I want to thank you for joining as a delegate today. And as a reminder, I just want to let you know that you have five minutes to address council and please ensure your remarks relate directly to the agenda item that you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your comments. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. A reminder to ensure your comments are directly related to the item you are speaking to. I will advise you when your five minutes is up at which time council may have questions for you. And just so you know, if you have uh, anything uh, playing in the background, whether it's a computer or YouTube, if you could just turn the volume down on that before you start. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ajuri Organa, and I am the executive director at Kind Mind Family Wellness. I figured I'll speak maybe a couple minutes about Kind Mind before I go into the purpose for my appearance this evening. Um, kind Mind Family Wellness is a not-for-profit uh, organization. It's a Black-led organization in Kitchener-Waterloo region. We officially launched in August of 2020. Uh, our core is really in providing um, social services to Black-identifying people in the region. Uh, from all ages, basically. 
Um, research really in, um, informs the work that we do at Time Minds. Um, most of our professionals are of um, social work background, human services, and um, just really public health related. We have a series of programs that we provide to residents of Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge. And we do this in collaboration and in partnerships with um, grassroots organizations as well as uh, mainstream organizations. And I'll quickly highlight some of our services at Kind Mind Family Wellness. We started mainly with culturally grounded um, counseling, so Afrocentric counseling services, um, and then um, moved towards um, culturally informed groups that we run for all ages. We also provide community outreach services as well as advocacy and education to individuals as well as organizations around systemic racism, oppression, basically how to dismantle um, the systems that uh, cause border harm to racialize and black identifying people. We also um, provide career services and employment support to newcomers, newcomers to Canada, um, starting mainly with international students, uh, but other newcomers, regardless if they are, are black identifying or not. Um, that's basically uh, an overview of what we do or what we provide. Um, I mentioned earlier that we are doing this in collaborations with organizations in the region. Um, that's really part of our strategic plan is that we do not want to duplicate services. We want to work together with other um, organizations to bring the services and support. So I'll quickly highlight some of our partners and the great work that we're doing. Um, starting with Cambridge, of course, we're in partnership with the Cambridge Self-Help Food Bank, as well as the Greenway Chaplain Community Services, as well as Cambridge. We're in partnership with the Sexual Assault Support Center, Family and Children's Services, specifically their um, resilient project, which is really working towards collective resilience. And uh, moving to our collaborators um, include um, the Immigration Partnership, Kitchener Waterloo Multicultural Center, Project Up, Region of Waterloo, Waterloo Regional District School Board, Lang, um, Horizon, and just to name a few. And this has just been in the span of um, starting in August of 2020 and realizing, of course, the disservice. Uh, to black identifying people and how we can work together strategically to meet their needs. So for the purpose of tonight is really to speak to our application for the community grants program. Um, at the time that we had applied for the, for the community grant, we did not or we were not able to demonstrate um, any sort of um, additional stream of revenue. And I'm here tonight just to share some updates things that have changed since the application that was submitted. Uh, we've been fortunate to get um, three streams from different levels of government or municipality, let's put it that way. Uh, we were able to secure uh, grants from New Horizons, so that's a federal grant, as well as a um, uh, um, provincial grant from United Way, and of course, the municipal grant from City of Kitchener. So basically here and hoping that we can be reconsidered as now we are seeking less than 30% of our revenue. And at the time that we had initially applied, uh, we didn't have any source. So it would seem that we were seeking 100% of our revenue. So that's the purpose um, for my appearance tonight and to hopefully seek an appeal for that application. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks for the presentation this evening. And then uh, I just want to turn it back to Council. And are there any questions that we have of the delegation tonight? Councillor Reed, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and, and clarification uh, to us. Uh, at how much are you actually seeking? That's my first question. How much are you actually seeking from grants for groups? I apologize, I missed that. <laughs> so that is, um, we're seeking $15,000. And also, I should also quickly add that um, I've requested that the clerk also pass on some additional documents um, as I didn't get it in on time. So hopefully you will get that with a minute. 16,000, you said? No, one five, 15,000. 15,000. Yeah, correct. Uh, second question is how if you have some idea, how many people uh, within the city of Cambridge are served by this group um, and your partners? 
currently, if uh, I'll speak to the words in, in hand, so with Cambridge uh, Self Help Food Bank, we are running a global cooking class with um, their community nutritionists. And so far, um, that is, uh, we have between 16 to 18 participants. It just started on Friday, just last Friday, and we're hoping for more people. Uh, we also have a mindfulness class that we're doing with them um, for basically any age group. I don't have the exact number because that just started today. Um, and then we have um, the gardening program and the summer um, summer camp that we will be running with um, 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 Greenway Chaplin Community Center. And we're hoping that that number can really increase. So I don't have the exact number. Um, so I would say in, gen in total between now and the end of 2020, sorry, 2021, I would hope that we would have been able to serve and support up to 60 Black identifying residents in Cam city of Cambridge alone, um, uh, in exclu excluding Kitchener and Waterloo. Thank you. And my third question is, you mentioned the city of Kitchener is giving you uh, some money as well. Could you share with us how much that they are willing to uh, uh, support you? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we are, um, we've been approved for $9,000 from the city of Kitchener towards our uh, book um, caregiver and children's book club that will be starting um, in May. Um, and that's the program that will run from May to December of 2021. So that's specifically for Kitchener residents, I assume? Um, no, it's a virtual program, so it's open to everybody. everybody. And all our partners in Cambridge, are, are they are aware, and they've been uh, promoting the program for us as well. And my last question is, is this the first time that you have applied to grants for groups? Through the Cam um, city of Cambridge, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reed. And uh, next we have Councillor Devine. Councillor Devine, go ahead. Yes, thank you to the chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. Your organization is is is, is it is a not 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 for profit? Correct. It is a not for profit. And how is it ran? It's run by members, so volunteers, so a group of volunteers, including myself. Okay, we have, have a uh, board, of, board of directors. Okay, and is it a registered charity? No, we, we do not have a registered charity status. So you're not, you're not registered charity? Okay. Um, no. You're not. Okay, that's, that's fine. Now, is this, uh, what geographical area do you cover? It's, you know, Waterloo, Cambridge, Guelph, um, because it's, most of our programs are run virtually, so... Um, uh, anyone from this area um, are able to participate. The challenge um, really is if we can, for Guelph specifically because we can get to them, but for Kitchener, Cambridge and Waterloo, all our partners and collaborators work with us in terms of um, some programming requiring um, participants to have resources prior to participating. So we co uh, coordinate that amongst ourselves. Okay, so that does not include North Dumfries or Woolwich? It does. Um, it, does. it does. Virtually, they are participating. I apologize. Um, thanks for clarifying that. So yes, um, anyone that can basically connect virtually and when we are when it is safe to provide um, services in, um, in person, they will qualify or they will be admitted to our programs as well. And what funding did uh, New Horizons give you and United Way? And has the city of Guelph uh, gave any funding? Nothing from the city of Guelph. So from United Way, um, it was it's a community grant towards our senior and youth program that we started running in uh, December of 2020. And New Horizon, um, it's the grant towards the seniors program, which just started this um, um, April 10th, this past uh, Saturday. And how much was that grant? Oh, uh, so United Way, we got $20,000. And for New Horizon, we got um, 25000 Okay, twenty twenty five. So, between your three funders at this point, you have thirty four thousand dollars. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's more. So forty five. So we have nine thousand, right? So there's twenty five. What if my math is correct? Forty five. Okay, twenty four thousand dollars. Okay. All right. I, I, I'll, okay. I'm obviously my numbers are not good. I heard. Uh, okay. All right. That's fine. All right, thank I you. can quickly clarify that. So 20 from United Way, yeah. 20,000, 25 from New Horizon, and 9,000 from the city of Kitchener. 
Okay, so it was 20, 25, and 9. Okay, that's clearly 54. Thank you very much. Okay, okay thank you. No problem. Thank you. And uh, do I see any other questions? And seeing none, thank you for your delegation this evening. You're more than welcome to continue watching on YouTube. And we thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Our third speaker this evening is Sarah Kilabui uh, with the Cambridge Cultural Association. And we're just going to take a minute to bring our third delegation on. Good evening, Hello? Sarah. Good evening, yes. Sarah. Can you if can you just turn the volume down in the background if you have anything playing in relation to the meeting? Okay. Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Councillor Mike Mann, and I want to thank you for joining us as a delegate tonight. And before we get started, I just have a couple of guidelines I'd like to explain. Sure. Just a reminder that you have five minutes to address council. And I'd ask that you please ensure your comments are relate directly to the agenda item that you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask you to end your remarks. Uh, we do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure that your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking council any questions. A reminder to ensure that your comments are directed, related or directly related to the item that you are speaking to. And I'll advise you when your five minutes is up, at which time council may have questions for you. And you may hear a, a bell in the background. That'll be the four minute mark. So you're welcome to proceed and welcome to the meeting. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, mayor and council. And thank you for taking uh, the time to listen to um, the Cambridge Cultural Association. Uh, we're basically asking for a reconsideration of the funding request. We did receive a letter on dated March 19th that um, they're un the committee is unable to provide funding due to the financial criteria under F3 of the grants to group policy. And we understand now that the 70% uh, must be generated from the organization. Uh, we would like to thank the committee for the 2019 funding that was approved and the 2020 funding that was approved, but due to COVID, uh, we were not able to have enough time to do an online festival. Uh, therefore, we're requesting for this year um, if we can um, have an approval of the funding as 70% of it has now been covered uh, through sponsors. Um, Toyota has confirmed the sponsor for this year. Um, Member of Parliament Tabera has confirmed all advertising uh, will be covered by their organization. MPP Amy C is a prospective funder because she um, helped us out in 2019. Also, we have uh, prospective funding from the following, the Meridian Credit Union. Uh, they helped us out in 2019. The Indian organization, Portuguese organization, the French organization, all in Cambridge, have prospective funding as they had approved it in 2019. Therefore, we're asking if you could help us out uh, this year. Uh, we're asking for 2700 which is 30% of our budget. We have confirmation from performers because the community is really interested in doing performances uh, for the festival. Um, we have good response from uh, vendors who are willing to uh, put some videos online to promote their company. We have a good um, community response and I have lots of confirmations of um, performers and acts actually who are willing to do it online this year. So uh, we are looking for your support again this year. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. And if you just hold on, there may be some questions from council. Uh, sure. And I do have a question from Councillor Devine, please go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. We funded you in 2019, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and that's that's the one you had, that's the event you had at Forbes Park? That is correct, sir. 
Okay, and we fund you in 2020, is that correct? Yes, but due to COVID, obviously, um, we did not proceed, and we didn't have enough time to do it online. Okay, that's fine. So what happened to the money from 2020 that we funded? If there was no, no we did not accept. We did not accept the funding. You did not accept the funding? That is correct. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, and I do see one other question. Councilor Reed, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much and, and welcome and I, I enjoyed your presentation. I just want to reassure myself that you are prepared this year to do a virtual uh, multicultural event. Uh, yes, uh, we have an IT department this year that I'm invested in and um, he's uh, provided me information as to how to send the performances um, for us to do it online with all the technology and all the um, uh, information that's needed from the performers for us to post it. And uh, you are asking for $2,700, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And not seeing any other questions. Thank you for your presentation, Sarah. We want to uh, let you know that you're welcome to continue watching the remainder of the meeting on YouTube if you would like to. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our fourth speaker this evening is Alex Horhein from Active Cambridge. And if you uh, just bear with us, we'll bring, we'll bring uh, Alex on in a moment. YouTube, if you would like to. So thank you for being here. Hello, Alex. Yes, yeah, speaking. Alex, if you could just turn the volume down in the background. I have done, yeah. Thank you. It's uh, Councillor Mike Mann with you, with you this evening, and thank you for joining today's delegation. Before, You're welcome, uh, Deputy before, Mayor. I didn't realize it was you talking. <laughs> before we get started, I just wanted to uh, identify some guidelines that we need to work with. Um, a reminder that you have five minutes to address council this evening, and please ensure that your comments relate directly to the agenda item that you're speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your remarks. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. A reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item that you are speaking to. I will advise you when your five minutes is up and you may hear a bell in the background advising of the four minute uh, mark. And then we'll ask, uh, council may have questions following that five minutes. So you're welcome, Alex, and you're welcome to begin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Mann and uh, councillors. I really do appreciate, excuse me. Pardon me, I just, my phone never goes off and I just went <laughs> off when I was about to speak. Um, anyway, thank you once again for the opportunity to speak this evening. And I would like to address the recent decision by the city, specifically the Grants for Groups um, uh, members, uh, as not to fund Active Cambridge, uh, specifically the Cambridge Fitness uh, Expo. We do understand the pressures of all the uh, social needs in our community, and sports and fitness may not seem like a priority to some. But I would like to point out that an active lifestyle can provide significant preventative medicine for all ages. I'll just cite a few quick uh, reports here. Uh, there, there have been extensive studies done, which are mostly available on the internet, showing the, the link between inactivity and obesity and all the other problems that stem from that. There have been many other studies that have looked specifically at sports and fitness and linking it with a, a feeling of well-being and, um, and belonging. Sports will do that, boosting self-esteem and relieving mental stress. And a lot of doctors will tell you that a lot of people are suffering with various levels of mental stress today and um, how sports and a good workout can really bring that level down, that stress level way down. Other studies have also said that educational studies have documented in multiple different uh, situations where physical activities in school boost academic performance significantly. And yet, despite all these reports, and they're, very, they're numerous, 
from very, very uh, distinguished people. Uh, the obvious Benny, uh, they are obvious benefits to our society. Participation, who run an annual survey every year, in 2010 gave Canada an F grade for meeting basic physical needs. And the most recent report released last year in 2020 has moved us all the way up to a D plus. So we still have a very, very long way to go. What we're dealing with, with nationally and locally is an epidemic of apathy from many. When it comes to physical activity, and it will continue to significantly impact our <coughs> health system on its current course. For 11 years, Active Cambridge has been dedicated to making a positive impact on this situation by educating, inspiring, and activating our community into a more active uh, lifestyle. The loss of our city's support does not only impact our ability to, to deliver on the programs that we, uh, we have made uh, popular every year, but also visibly undermines our credibility uh, by not having your support. Having the city behind us all these years has made a huge difference. I might, if I might, I might take a little bit of time and go through the, um, the history of Active Cambridge. Active Cambridge was formed in 2007 in response to many coaches and trainers concerns with a lack of activity in our community. The city was operating a form of uh, the fitness expo at that time, but felt they did not, not have resources and in some cases the expertise to continue. They offered the program to Active Cambridge with the promise to also provide funding. And we were actually in the city budget for a number of years. Several years into the program, the funding had, was reduced significantly due to budget cuts, even though the popularity of the event had, had grown significantly. In 2020, we were taken out of the city's budget completely and told we would have to apply um, uh, for possible funding. This year, we were turned down completely for any funding for the Expo. During the last 11 years, Active Cambridge has been operating. Uh, the city has turned, us, turned to us many times for help. When the Winter Olympics torch came through in 2010, the city asked us to arrange a sports demo at City Hall. When participation in CBC, ran a contest to find the most active city in Canada. Once again, a city came to AC. Uh, we brought home the award for the most active city in Ontario and the second most active city in Canada. We've been recognized by the BAA as the best run small profit um, business in, in um, Cambridge. Um, and through all, these dis all the discussions around the multiplex, we presented to the city on behalf of our many sports and fitness groups eight times during, this, during that time, showing a comprehensive view of what the wants and needs were in our community. Finally, our founder of Active Cambridge received the Order of Canada as well for his work in developing this program and making it available to our, our, our um, community. I believe Active Cambridge has worked closely with the city on many occasions and has always delivered. I hope that you will reconsider your decision and help us continue our important work. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Alex. And we'll just turn it to uh, council and ask if there are any questions of council to, uh, to Alex. Uh, I do see a couple of questions and the first one is Councillor Ameta. Please go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Alex, for your presentation. I think you kind of touched upon my question, but I'll just read it in case you have anything to add. It's about um, how did Active Cambridge get into running the Fitness Expo and how has it changed over the years and um, where do you kind of see it going like um, in terms of um, how things are being run in the success? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. Yes, as I mentioned in the history, we've been working with the city in a very collaborative way for a lot of years. The, the, the Expo itself um, has grown exponentially um, uh, every year. And it's, we need to believe it's one way to get our younger people and get them inspired by sport in a very, um, at a very early age. Um, so what we, we usually do is bring all of our, our groups out, and it's usually up to 30 of them, and they all provide in that day an opportunity for the, um, for the youngsters to try everything from uh, curling to yoga 
And uh, we, we measure that success every year by giving out passports to the kids. And every, every, um, of everything they try, they get a little, uh, after they've done 10, they get a little uh, sticker on a card. When they fill the card, uh, they come back to Active Cambridge and we give them a little prize for their work. It's not unusual for us to have over 1,500 tries in one day. Uh, they have kids going around trying all these different events. And we've got a lot of also um, evidence back from our members to say that once the expo is over, the kids have gone and joined up in some of these, uh, these groups. Um, it, and that happens quite regularly. So I think, you know, definitely our plan would be uh, hopefully to keep the expo going. We've all already expanded it from one day a year to two. And um, we also look forward to taking a similar version into the schools and, and start showing the schools. We have tried what we call try it days before, and we'd like to continue doing that to try to inspire these youngsters to, you know, just to follow a more active lifestyle and do it in a very enjoyable way. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Alex. And uh, we'll move on now to Councillor Reed. please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Alex. It's nice to hear from you again. And, and I do appreciate all the work that you do uh, with sports and active uh, Cambridge and, and encouraging all of us to be more active in our lifestyles. So uh, my question is, why did we turn you down? Um, I believe that the, uh, the the answer we were really given was that um, the, uh, the powers uh, that made the decision, I guess, felt that um, we we could work more collaboratively with the city, but there was very little explanation what that really meant. Uh, we are working collaboratively with the city now, uh, but you know these things, as you all know, don't come without funds, and so uh, that's kind of the reason that I saw. Okay, and the second question is, uh, how much are you seeking from the grants for groups? Uh, in in, uh, in uh, this year, in 2021, our request is fairly modest. In a normal year, we would, would be requesting around about $3,000. Uh, that would allow us to run both fitness expos. Uh, this year, because COVID is having its terrible effects, uh, we probably won't be able to start our progress up till later in the year. So I would expect that $1,500 for 2021 would actually work very well for us. And possibly if, if, if the expo can't happen this year because of extended problems with COVID, then next year we would be asking for probably another $1,500 so that we could run two programs in 22. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Councillor Reed, And I see Councillor Hamilton is next. Please go ahead. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you very much, Alex, for your presentation. Uh, you actually, I think, just partially answered this, but um, anything fitness related, it's typically very social. Um, we're seeing COVID have a dire effect on anything from, you know, playing basketball to going to a fitness center. Uh, so, how has COVID changed the nature of, of your operation, if at all? Um, and my second question would just be, uh, I know Recreation and Culture will be working with the group in, in 2021. That's what's listed in our council package. If you could just expand upon how you might see some of that work unfolding, if COVID is still around, uh, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I'll answer the first part, does, um, Scott, uh, Councillor Hamilton. I'm not sure I completely understand the second part. So to, to answer the first part of the question, um, Sorry, can you ask the question again? <laughs> sure, no worries. It's uh, because fitness is typically pretty hands-on and engaging, right? Um, yeah. If if we're still in this digital Zoom world uh, for the next little while, for the foreseeable future, how does that change your program, if at all? Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll answer that by saying that we, like everybody else, we try to turn to online um, visuals as best we can. We do have quite a nice collection of videos uh, on YouTube that people can, um, can tap into. They're available to anybody. So there's everything on there for how to run properly, how to tie your running shoes properly, um, how to play ball, uh, what could, there are games you can do with a ball uh, for families. So there's quite a good um, library of videos that we continue to add to. So that's kind of how we're having to operate at the moment. Internally within our groups, 
we're working with the groups to try to help keep their morale up as best we can because some of our, our groups are small and quite frankly, they're struggling to hang on themselves. So anything we can do for them in the way of helping them with information uh, and exposing them perhaps to um, things that they need to, to know about, we, we try to do that. So there was a second part to the question, if you wouldn't mind asking that again. Thank you. I think you've actually just partially answered it, but it was um, how exactly you would be working with, with recreation and culture going forth in 2021. Well, again, you know, our whole emphasis is to just get people active. And we have tried a number of different programs through the years. Obviously, videos is one of them, um, inspiring people by telling stories about, you know, some of our young athletes around Cambridge, and there's a lot of them um, who have who aspired to greater things. Uh, you know, we've had gymnasts uh, going to the Olympic Games. We've had cyclists going to the Olympic Games. So we try to tell those stories. And, and then as soon as we're able to get back outside, we certainly want to run programs that encourage not just youth, but also adults as well to continue with a more active lifestyle. That's great. Thank you for answering my questions, Alex. Appreciate it. Thank you for asking. Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you for participating in our, our meeting as a delegation today. You're more than welcome to uh, continue watching the remainder of the meeting on the YouTube Cambridge YouTube channel if you'd like to. Okay, thanks, Deputy, Deputy Mayor Mann and Council. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for listening to me yet one more time. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. And now we'll move on to uh, Councillor Reid. I believe you have the, uh, the motion and I would ask that you would read it in its entirety. If you could unmute yourself, it would help. Thanks. Sorry about that. It's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Wolf. The recommendation is that Council Report 21-064 CRS regrants to groups be received and that the recommendations from the grants to group review committee as outlined in Appendix A be approved by Council. On uh, in speaking to this, if we want to make amendments to uh, uh, the grants to groups, given that we have heard from various people, how and when do we do this? Thank you, Councillor Reed. And uh, this is the opportunity to talk about uh, those amendments that uh, uh, you want to put forward, uh, as any councillor may want to put forward. So please go ahead. Yes. Well, the first, I have a question that I'd like to uh, uh, put to our CFO, just to ensure that uh, what we have heard from each of the delegations tonight meets uh, the uh, criteria of grants for groups. And so that if, if we were to um, make uh, recommendations for money to these groups, that it would follow along with the guidelines that, uh, we, that have been established. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Ayers, are you able to answer that? Yes, thank you. And through you, Deputy Mayor Mann. Um, thank you for the questions, Councillor Reed. And just to confirm, uh, with the cardiac care, the concern was that they were providing funding to a charitable organization, which they clarified through their delegation that that was not the case. So if the council wanted to provide the funding as requested to them, it would be in compliance with the policy. Um, the Kind Minds organization, uh, they were asking for 100% of their funding from the city, which they have now um, explained that they have other funding sources, so that's no longer the case. So they are now in compliance with the policy as well, if council wants to provide some funding to them. Um, the Cambridge Cultural Association, um, They, their delegation, they've clarified um, that they are also in compliance with the policy now. And Active Cambridge, uh, as council or as the committee may recall during our meetings with um, the group, we decided that the services that Active Cambridge provides could be done by our recreation and culture staff. 
So the letter to Active Cambridge explained that the city would take on that fitness expo as a program that we would offer and we would like to do it in collaboration with Active Cambridge rather than providing the funding to them to provide that fitness expo. So our recreation and culture staff would like to work together with Active Cambridge to deliver that program rather than providing funding to them. So I hope that helps to clarify for you. Well, it, it does help to clarify and I because I was trying to remember and I my memory wasn't as good as I had hoped it would be. Uh, but I would like to make uh, some amendments. I don't know if we would do like if uh, Deputy uh, Mayor, you'd like them one at a time or if you would like them all in, in one motion. Maybe what we could do is hear what uh, we have two other speakers who would like to speak. And before any any motion would come forward, if we could hear from the other speakers and then see if we can de decide one at a time what we would if we want to make any changes to those who have made a request this evening. OK, well, you'll come back to me for the motions then. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reid. And we'll move on to Councillor Devine. Yes, to the chair, Councillor Mann. Um, on this document, page 417, there is a $777 that would appear was requested by the Fashion History Museum, which struck me as being very, very odd. So I called the Fashion History Museum today. I said, if you've been funded through um, the budget, why, why, why are you looking for another $777? I find that bizarre. So this is a $777 bill. They are not requesting money out of the groups or grants. They're not. And I want to make that clear, please. They submitted a $777 bill to the city to either have it paid through economic development or through the MAC tax for a Todd sign on the 401, which was $777. That's my understanding. So through uh, the chair of the Groups for Grants, uh, Councillor Meta, and Cheryl, uh, uh, Ms. Harris. Could we possibly have a look at that, please? Because I think that's just been misdirected. It's almost almost kind of just, I, I just struck me odd that it was even, even there. So that's why I inquired. Okay. Thank you. So then maybe what we can do is just have staff take a look at that and uh, come back with an explanation uh, at, an, at a later date. Please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wolf, please. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Well, I was going to make some amendments, so um, and I guess we have to decide on Sorry. some amounts. Um, uh, yes, what we'll do is we'll, we'll wait. If you want to make some comments, that's great, but I think what we'll do is we'll get those comments on the floor, and then we'll come back. I, I know Councillor Reed wants to make some amendments, and, and so do you. Okay, so uh, so I won't. I'll just give my some of my comments. Um, I think for the Healthy Heart Day, uh, we should be supporting them. I think um, we it's a very worthy cause, and the fact that they have 560 people already registered and will will reach up to 8,000 people or more than 8,000 people. I think uh, it's something that we should support. Um, the Kind Minds Family Wellness, uh, I, I also think deserves some, some su support. Um, it's a, obviously, it's a, a new organization, um, but I'm not sure $15,000 is what we should be giving it. Um, since they're not, they said they thought they could re reach 60 people. So, um, I would give some money, but not the 15,000 in my mind. The Cambridge Cultural Association um, seems like they're doing good work as well. And uh, they're asking just for 2,700. Uh, they've cut their original um, ask. And I think that would be worth us supporting. And uh, even... Um, the Active Cambridge Expo is, they're only asking for $1,500 and they have a long tradition with us of doing more than just the Expo. Uh, so, um, and we call on them every time 
we need um, support, for instance, for the, for the rec centers. So um, I wouldn't be adverse to giving them some funding. Anyway, those are my comments. Thanks, Councillor Wolf. And we'll move on to Councillor Ameta. Well, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, my comments um, at this time are short. I would just like to echo what Councillor Wolf had said. I pretty much agree with everything she stated. Um, she worded it very well what I was thinking. And um, with the Act of Cambridge, I know we're still trying to figure out the expo and what I was gonna propose um, very generally anyways, is um, we could allow for some time to either review that like through more consultation or we could look at still giving them some funding, um, but for something else, or if we could um, set the funding aside and like kind of red circle it just so we have more time to figure out what's going on with the expo. But I, I think they've done a phenomenal job every year and I am open to having them do it again this year, at least until we can take more time to review for the future. But those are my comments right now anyways, and I know more will be said. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Meta. And uh, before we move on to uh, Councillor Adshade, I just want to welcome Councillor Liggett to the meeting. And uh, Councillor Liggett, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Can't hear you, but I think you said no. No. Oh, thank you. Got it. Okay, now we'll move on to Councillor Adjay, please. Oh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I agree with what Councillor Wolf, uh, her summary of, of extra grants to group funding. I think that makes sense to me. I don't think we need to spend the 15, total 15,000 on the one group, but I would like to see Active Cambridge until we get something set up with the city. That's going to take a while. They've done some really good work in the city, and I think uh, Active Cambridge really supports the sporting community. So I'd be willing, you know, I think we should give them the 1,500, but uh, I know we could look at maybe working together in the future with the city and Active Cambridge, but until that's done, that could take a while. I think we should give them the $1,500. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Adshade. And I think what we'll do now is uh, Councillor Reed wanted to make a, a recommendation uh, in relation to at least one organization. And I think what we'll do is we'll hear that and maybe get some feedback from Councillor and from Council and we'll move on uh, one at a time. So Councillor Reed, if you want to proceed. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I'll start right from <laughs> the, the very beginning of our, our grants for, for groups. Um, if I can see my notes here, uh, that uh, the first people that uh, that wanted it were the uh, the heart people, uh, the the one day event, and I am proposing uh, that we give them four thousand dollars, which was what we gave them last year, since they now uh, have shown that they're in comply with uh, what what the terms of are for the grants for groups. I, I think that we want to continue to support this. It's a very popular uh, event in Cambridge, and uh, so I'm hoping that I would get support for the four thousand dollars for the uh, heart. One, I've forgotten the proper name. Somebody has it. Thank you, Councillor Reed. It's a healthy heart. Yeah, yes. And so, what we could do is con continue to speak about this and vote on each one separately. So, is there any comments from uh, the rest of Council in relation to the four thousand dollar recommendation that Councillor Reed has suggested for the healthy hearts? Councillor Meta. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to say that it does have my support. And um, I did have some concerns earlier about the process, but that's been cleared up tonight. So um, it's got my full support. They do excellent work. Thank you. And uh, seeing no other comments in relation to that, I think what we'll do is we'll move on to the next one, which was uh, the Kind Minds. And does anybody want to speak to Kind Minds? 
Oh, yeah. I think, uh, Ms. Ayers, you want to speak to probably Healthy Hearts first. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Mann. Um, I'm okay with Healthy Heart. Um, I just wanted to clarify in regards to the, um, the delegation for Kind Mind. They had asked for $15,000. And as per the policy, the Grants to Group program will grant a maximum of 10000 to any one organization. So just something to keep in mind for um, Council to consider as you're delegating on this matter. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Councillor Reed. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I'm going to propose uh, $4,000 to the Kind Minds. This is a new program for us. Uh, and I think that uh, we do need to support it in some way, shape or form. Kitchener supported it to, I think, 9,000. And, and so I think that uh, if we do the 4,000, the same as we did for Healthy Hearts, uh, that gives them uh, a good base in, in which to continue their work here in Cambridge. Thank you, Councillor Reid. And then uh, turning to the rest of Council, uh, comments in relation to the Kind Minds uh, suggestion by Councillor Reid of $4,000. And I don't see any hands. I don't see a request for any comments. So I'll move on to the next item. And that was the Cambridge Cultural Association. Any, any comment or suggestion in relation to the Cambridge Cultural Association? Councillor Reed, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, church, this is close to me because it's in, uh, usually takes place in Hesper. And uh, so I am, uh, very pleased that they have come into uh, agreement with our terms. And so therefore I'm suggesting that we support them to what they requested, $2,700. Thank you, Councillor Reed and uh, Councillor Devine, go ahead. Yes, uh, through Councillor Mann. Uh, Ms. Ayers, the funding that was given last year in 2020 was that my, was that sent back? For you, Deputy Mayor Mann, when the pandemic hit early in 2020, we did not release all of the funding to the groups. Um, and we checked in with them early, like in March, we were checking in with groups to see if they were going to be holding their events or not. So we didn't release all of the funding to the groups who were holding events that we knew were not going to happen and we would check in with them throughout the year to see if the events did happen or not and only release funding to groups who were able to hold an event or carry out the activities that they had applied for with their grant funding. Thank you. Great, thanks for the clarification. And seeing no further hands, I'm going to go on to uh, item number four. The, the, the last item was Active Cambridge. And does anybody want to speak to Active Cambridge? And uh, I'm surprised, but it's Councillor Reed. <laughs> Please go ahead. Well, uh, it is because I was on the committee. So, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we hassled a lot of these around and uh, certainly we know the kind of work that Alex Lorraine and his, and his group has done and they're certainly in not providing funds for them. It never in any sense was that we were disappointed. We certainly have never been disappointed by the work that they do. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it, it appears that in working together with our recreation department, it has not really happened yet. And so I'm quite willing to give them the uh, uh, $1,500. Oh, there goes my phone. 1500 Thank you, Councillor Reed. And um, are there any other comments in relation to the suggestion that Councillor Reed has made in as far as $1,500 for Active Cambridge?
and seeing none, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our clerk just to read back to us what we have talked about uh, this evening in relation to the grants to groups presentation. And so I'll ask Madam Clerk if you could just uh, uh, summarize for Council what, what we've uh, agreed upon or what we've presented rather at this time. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, through you. The amendment would read as follows. So I'm gonna read the last portion of the recommendation first, and that recommendations from the Grants to Groups Review Committee as outlined in Appendix A be approved by council and further that the following funding be allocated in addition to the recommendations from the Grants to Group Review Committee. Healthy Heart Day 17 be allocated $4,000. Kind Minds Family Wellness be allocated $4,000. Cambridge Cultural Association be allocated $2,700. And Active Cambridge be allocated $1,500. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now that the, the uh, revised motion is on the floor, are there any questions of staff from council? Does council have any comments that they'd like to make? Seeing no questions, what I'll do is I'll ask that uh, we vote on the amendment first, those four, four additional changes that we made, and then we'll vote on the, uh, on the full motion. So Madam Clerk, I think before we can do that, Councillor Liggett is waving her finger at us. I, oh. I, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh, Go good. ahead. Go ahead, please. Um, I wasn't here for any of the presentations. So I, I have a question. The Kind Minds Family Wellness, what is that? I think, uh, Ms. Ayers, did you want to speak to that? Okay, through you, Councillor Manor. Deputy Mayor Mann, um, the kind mind, sorry, I'm just going back to the, the database that we have for all the um, requests. The kind minds is a new organization that is just starting up. They specialize in culturally suitable counseling, education, research, advocacy on anti-black racism and systemic oppression. They support navigating community services and the delivery of culturally informed educational programs and groups for children, youth, and adults. Okay. Thank, so, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could ask. So um, is this only for uh, uh, Black members of the community? You said cultural, so I'm just asking the question. Yeah, I'm through you, Deputy Mayor Mann. I'm not entirely sure, but that seems to be the focus of the programs that they offer and the, the work that they do. And is this money uh, to be only spent in Cambridge? They uh, mentioned that they have received funding also from the city of Kitchener, as well as United Way and New Horizons as well as the self-help food bank. So they have a number of organizations that they are partnering with. And I assume because they have received funding from Kitchener as well, that they offer um, programs in other municipalities and residents from Kitchener may um, participate in Cambridge programs and vice versa would be my understanding. Hmm. I have a ton of questions. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I, if I could comment now, I'm concerned if we're giving money to an organization that is, is a regional organization versus a Cambridge organization. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I just would sort of like to have that addressed. I'm, I'm not sure how to even vote on this one. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with what the work that they do. I just don't want it leaving the city. And Ms. Sarah, I'm not sure if you can provide some of that criteria that we use to make those decisions based on uh, granting uh, funds to different organizations. Uh, if you could, please. Thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor Mann. The policy does suggest that if a group 
um, offers programs that benefit more than just residents within the city of Cambridge that they apply to the region of Waterloo for funding first. Uh, through the delegation, Kind Minds did not mention that they have applied to the region of Waterloo. They only mentioned that they have applied to the city of Kitchener. So I'm not sure um, if they have applied and were not approved for funding through the region. I, I didn't understand that from their delegation or their submission. I believe um, they did not apply to the region, which is a requirement of our policy. So Mr. Chair, if I could make a request. Yeah. Just, just before you do, I wouldn't mind hearing what Councillor Reed and Councillor Wolf have to say because they may be able to answer some of your, your questions. And then if I can come back to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Reed, go ahead, please. Yes. One of the things that I wanted to mention is that uh, there, we're doing things still virtually. And when you do things virtually, uh, it tends to go beyond our borders. And uh, so many of the grants that we have uh, given out to uh, various groups, as, as you notice in the attachment, uh, would, would go beyond the border of uh, Cambridge and would be available to other people within the region. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Councillor Reed. And then moving on to Councillor Wolf, please. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, and to uh, Councillor Leggett, uh, they did talk about programs that they are running in Cambridge. One was um, uh, a global cooking class with um, our food bank at the food bank, and they had 16 to 18 people already registered to that. Um, they are also doing a gardening summer camp with one of our um, neighborhood associations and uh, then uh, a couple of other programs. So they're definitely uh, working in Cambridge. They asked for 15,000, that's why we're, we're giving them 4,000. Um, and, uh, and they did say like their programs are open to, to everyone. However, their focus is to try to reach um, you know, a, a certain communities that are underserviced. So um, I feel quite comfortable in giving them the $4,000. Thank you, Councillor Wolf. And I'll just move to Ms. Ayers again before we come back to Councillor Liggett. Ms. Ayers, please. Thank you. And through you again, Deputy Mayor Mann. Um, one thing I also noted in their application is that they they are requesting funding to establish a presence in Cambridge through a partnership with Cambridge Community Association, as well as the Greenway Chaplain Community Center. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Councillor Liggett. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm I'm all, I'm comfortable now with uh, giving them the funds. I you know with what has been said here and the fact that they want to. Uh, um, uh, assume a presence here in Cambridge. So I think next year we can ask more in-depth questions once we have a bit of history from them and, and make them understand that it has to be uh, spent in the community of Cambridge. So I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, seeing no further questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Madam Clerk if she would just read the amendment to us again, and then we'll vote on the, on the amendment and then the entire motion. Uh, so over to you, please, Madam Chair, or Madam, Madam Clerk. So the amendment is, and that fo the following funding be allocated in addition to the recommendations from the Grants to Groups Review Committee. Cambridge Cultural Association be allocated $2,700. Kind Minds Family Wellness be allocated $4,000. Healthy Heart Day 17 be allocated $4,000 and Active Cambridge to be allocated $1,500. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And are there any questions from council? Any further comments? Then I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Oh, before we do, Councillor Reed, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to make the comment that in uh, in 
adding those additional funds to it, we still have money left over in case things come up during the year that we want to give grants for groups. And according to uh, my calculations, but I certainly could be uh, uh, corrected by Ms. Ayers, but I think we've got 17,300 left in, in the fund for grants for groups and that can be allocated should something come up during the year that we really want to support. That was my comment. Thank you. <coughs> then what we'll do is I'll just ask uh, Madam Clerk if you would call for the vote. Councillor Adchate. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Armada. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. And next, what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, uh, put the main motion on the floor as amended and vote on that. So Madam Clerk, if you would, please. Would you like me to, would you like me to read the main motion as amended? Please. Moved by Councillor Reed, seconded by Councillor Wolf. Recommendation that Council Report 21064 CRS re-grants to groups be received and that the recommendations from the Grants to Groups Committee, sorry, Review Committee as outlined in Appendix A be approved and further that the following funding be allocated in addition to the recommendations from the Grants to Group Review Committee. Cambridge Cultural Association be funded $2,700. Kind Minds Family Wellness be funded $4,000. Healthy Heart Day 17 be funded $4,000. Active Cambridge be funded $1,500. And are there any questions? Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any questions for staff? Seeing none, are there any comments that council would like to make? Seeing none, I'll ask for the, the clerk to call for the, the vote then, please. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Niggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. And uh, the next item on the agenda is item number 7.3.1 growing the green belt and it's a recommendation report. Councillor Hamilton, you have the motion. Could you please read it in its entirety? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Mann. Uh, it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Ermetta. Recommendation that Cambridge Council receives report number 21-097 CD, consultation on growing the size of the green belt, city of Cambridge opportunity to respond for information and that Cambridge Council endorsed the recommendation by city staff to oppose any expansion of the Greenbelt plan in the city of Cambridge, unless the province provides for the following. One, modify the Greenbelt plan to allow municipalities to adopt or retain official plan policies more stringent than the requirements of the Greenbelt plan in relation to mineral aggregate resources and the protection of municipal drinking water supplies. Two, Modify the Greenbelt plan to include a policy framework that provides for the protection of groundwater resources that supply municipal drinking water. And three, consult directly with the City of Cambridge, the Region of Waterloo, and the Grand River Cons Conservation Authority to delineate the location of any Greenbelt expansion using the best available ecological and hydrogeological data and other relevant technical information. And further, that report number 21-097CD and its resulting resolution be provided to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing as the City of Cambridge comments. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Now to Council, are there any questions of staff? Councillor Reed. 
Yes, I would just like to direct this uh, to staff, probably Ms. Brunshaw, as to uh, give us a little background on, on this and what is happening here. Uh, to me, this sounds like uh, the uh, this proposal that we're making to the government is one that we should be supporting, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about it. Thank you, Councillor Reed and Ms. Brunshaw, if you would. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We have Kathy Paget, um, who was the author of the report available this evening to answer questions. So I'd appreciate if Ms. Paget has a chance to answer first. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Paget. Good evening, Council. I apologize, my YouTube video was going at the same time as you were speaking, so <laughs> I, I missed the, the initial question. My apologies. Uh, Councillor Reed, if you could just repeat your, your question and uh, we could have Ms. Paget answer that for us. Certainly, yes, and, and my apologies that I should have directed it to you. Uh, and so really what I want is some background on, on uh, this. It appears to me that uh, this is something that we really want to support uh, because we want to uh, ensure uh, that our green belt is, is saved. Uh, so I just thought that if you could provide for us some of the background of what is happening and why it is happening and what we're attempting to do here might help us. Sure, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the, the Greenbelt Plan has been in place uh, in the, the greater Toronto area for a number of years now, and they, they have looked at expanding the Greenbelt uh, a couple years ago out towards the region of Waterloo. Uh, so there's a, a new government in place and they're, they're looking at doing this again. So this time the um, green belt, they're proposing the study area could impact the uh, Gulf Paris Moraine, which is partially impacting the city of Cambridge in the Northeast portion uh, beyond the urban area boundary and in, an, in the area where it's currently uh, prime agricultural land. Uh, that area of the city is also the only area in the city identified in our official plan as having potential uh, mineral, mineral aggregate resources. So upon reviewing the information about having the green belt expanded to the city, currently our policies in the regional official plan and city um, of Cambridge official plan have stronger policies in our official plans than the green belt plan would provide. So if the Greenbelt plan was applied to Cambridge, the province could require that we remove or weaken some of our existing aggregate policies. Uh, currently, the regional and city official plans prohibit aggregate extraction in core environmental features, whereas the Greenbelt doesn't. Also, the Greenbelt doesn't allow for municipalities to have stronger policies than the Greenbelt with respect to aggregate, mineral aggregate extraction. So, we would have to essentially have weaker policies than we currently have. So that's why the request is that, uh, one of the recommendations is that municipalities be allowed to have more stringent policies related to mineral, mineral aggregate extraction. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I think when when I first looked at this and the green belt expansion seemed to me like this was a good thing. <laughs> but when you look into it a little bit further, you find out there there are some things about it that uh, uh, that aren't uh, up to the level that we would like it to be. So thank you for your explanation. Thank you. And moving on, we have Councillor Hamilton, please go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Mann, and through you. Uh, and thanks for being on the line as well, Kathy. Um, just a follow up uh, to Councillor Reed's comments, and I, I suppose just a clarification. So, right now, what this motion is basically saying is that if you contrast the green belt with the official plan, um, our official plan gives us more control and protection over our own lands, and it uh, facilitates or, or pretty much demands the province to engage in consultation with us. 
um, about anything that's going to happen within our, our designated official plant area. Uh, would that be correct? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I think that would be a good characterization of what we're recommend, recommending. Um, currently, the, the proposal indicates that they're not looking at changing the Greenbelt policies, and that would just like be a blanket application to where it would apply. So that's why we're requesting that modifications be made so that municipalities can have more stringent policy. Well, thank you. And if I may uh, make a quick comment, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, following up on Kathy's comments, I, I do, uh, I am in support of this motion. I think it's very important whenever it comes to any environmental resources that the municipality and the residents that are going to be faced with the potential adverse effects of aggregate mining or adverse drinking water conditions, that the city and the residents maintain control over those precious resources because we've seen around the country in Ontario that once those are corrupted or uh, if there's anything that, uh, any dire fate that befalls them, um, the ramifications can be severe. So in this case, I fully support this motion and I think uh, we will, we will be the best stewards of our environment, not necessarily someone uh, down the 401 or in another city. So I'm in full support of this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. And moving on to Councillor Liggett, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Kathy, uh, you know, as we all know, the province can override anything we do when it comes to this stuff. We've seen what they've already done with the uh, green belt so far. Um, actually, it wasn't this government. I think it was the previous one started doing that. Um, but when you say the northeast corner of Cambridge for the uh, aggregates, where is it exactly? I, when I look at these maps, they're kind of skewed. And um, I don't even know if that's on there. Can you tell me where that is? Because I didn't know we had one in the northeast corner. Uh, sure. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Council, are you your... Um, your question is it related to where the mineral aggregates are or where yes. the green belt policy would apply? No, no, no. The, the mineral aggregate, the aggregates, yeah. Sure, it, it's it's actually a schedule in our official plan and forgive me, I don't have um, a, just a general, graph. Just generally, that's fine. Yeah, it's just in the Northeast portion, uh, basically of, of the city of Cambridge map, um, just, just beyond the urban area boundary. In, in the prime ag agricultural area. So north of the 401 and- Yeah, yeah, and beyond any built area, it's, it's beyond, uh, it's in the country base, the, beyond the countryside line in the city of Cambridge. So between Frank um, and town line? Uh, I apologize, I don't know the exact location. It is is north of um, the, the Moffitt, um, the, um, the residential subdivisions up that way, like basically just beyond the residential areas in the northeast portion of Cambridge. And, and just, I'll just interrupt here. Maybe uh, Ms. Brunshaw can speak to that. I know she wanted to provide some further clarification. Go ahead, please, Ms. Brunshaw. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So it's, it's in the Blackbridge, north of the Blackbridge area. We can provide council with a copy of that map uh, separately from this meeting, just so that you all have that reference um, and provide you with that additional detail. Thank you. I'd, I'd appreciate that, Elaine. I didn't know that we had any there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your... Thank you. Uh, moving on, we have Councillor Emetta. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, I was going to just say that um, I do think it was in that area around Blackbridge Road, but I'm glad that Ms. Brunshaw had confirmed that. So I, I, I do believe staff have done their due diligence with this motion. Um, I Obviously, I'm um, expanding the green belt in some capacity is a good thing, but I think it needs to be carefully considered with um, the policies that are in place that it does not weaken our policies. And also looking 30 years, 40 years down the road, we also need to make sure that Cambridge will have room for future industry. You know, we do right now, but will we decades down the road? So I think wherever the line is drawn, there needs to be that balance between allowing for enough room for future industry, but also protecting our natural environment, which is so important. And, um, you know, I, I took a course actually on this in the university. And um, 
one of the things that was raised when I was learning more about the green belt was it's not just for environmental protection, it's also to preserve land for aggregate expansion. And um, that is a concern that I do have with the green belt. And you know, there, there are areas that are good for aggregate, but I don't think in our city limits would be one of them. And um, I think we need to make sure that we have those stronger policies in place before any green belt expansion is considered. And I also think too, it would be good to look at adding in some of our parks into the green belt um, for protection, such as Shades Mills Conservation Area or the Chiligo Conservation Area, like those areas along the Speed River. They can't be developed anyways. They're not gonna be um, mined for aggregate. And one good thing about the green belt is that it does protect land from urban expansion. So I think it would be beneficial eventually to have our, some of our parks included in the green belt as long as the policies are not weakened. So my thoughts, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ameta, and we'll move on to Councillor Devine, please. Go ahead. Yes, to Councillor Matt, I, I support the, uh, the motion, to be honest with you. Uh, but when we talk about aggregate, there's a lot of aggregate in and around Cambridge. Uh, Preston Sand and Gravel, there's a big, uh, it was a big sand pit in Preston, gravel pit in Preston. And it's been remediated, and there's probably four or 500 homes in there. Right? We, can't, uh, we can't forget that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of gravel in the area. And the gravel on the uh, uh, northeast corner of Cambridge is... Uh, it's pretty much between uh, Blackbridge Road and uh, Dickey Settlement. And I don't know if a lot of people probably don't know where Dickey Settlement is, but part of it was in Cambridge at one point. And it's right in Highway 24. So in, in there, there's uh, gravel and also limestone quarry. And that uh, over time, when it's mined out, it, it can certainly be remediated. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to Councillor Liggett, please go ahead. Hey, Mr. Chair, uh, just to follow up on uh, Councillor Mehta saying that who, there's certain areas that can't be done, I just want to remind everybody that we should never say never because parks can be sold off and uh, development can, any, any future council can sell a park and development can happen. And, uh, I, and also in Schneider's Flats was um, mined uh, quite aggressively for uh, aggregate. So I, I just keep thinking we need to may have as much protection as possible to put roadblocks in the way of future development that could be uh, undermine our environmental um, attributes that we have now. And removing gravel out of some of those areas affects our groundwater. So I think it's very important that this, this uh, motion be passed tonight, and, I, and I'm uh, very thankful that council, um, sorry, that staff has done the work that they have and that we have this before us tonight. I, I look forward to passing this, thanks. Thank you, and seeing no other uh, comments or questions, I, I, I want to uh, commend staff as well for the work that they have done on this, uh, this item. When you see uh, extending or expanding the green belt, as Councillor Reed said, you think that's a good thing. But then when you read the fine print and you find out that uh, it's not to our benefit, uh, we have far more stringent rules and policies in place. It's important that we maintain those. So again, thank you to staff for the work that they did and bringing this to our, to our attention the way you did. So uh, we want to commend you for that. Uh, I'll now ask the clerk to call for the vote, please. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. And uh, before we move on to our next item, we're going to take a five minute break and we'll ask people to come back in five minutes. Thanks, everyone.
Well, welcome back everybody and thank you for uh, joining us again. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item 7.3.2 and that's report 21-071, uh, Newman Drive sidewalk installation. And we have Dennis Lopes, our senior civil engineering technology technologist with us this evening and Dennis is going to provide a presentation. So just get the clerk to share the screen and, and Dennis, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So you're set to go, Dennis. Go ahead, please. Right. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of council, senior staff, and members of the public. My name is Dennis Lopes, senior civil engineering technologist. I'm here to speak on Newman Drive sidewalk insulation. Next slide, please. Uh, during the Cambridge West planning stage, concerns were received from residents on Newman Drive. And as part of the subdivision approvals, the installation of the sidewalk was approved. Also, the developer contributed funds towards the sidewalk project. Next slide, please. A uh, virtual pu uh, public information center was held in January of this year. And the design presented included a Bullard sidewalk on the north east side of Newman Drive. Um, there was a bowler width of 1.6 meters on the north side and a 1.0 meter bowler on the east side. Uh, it also included potential removal of 12 trees and a new retaining wall. Next slide, please. What we heard, um, the main concerns received from the PIC were the number of potential tree removals, impacts to the driveway links, and impact to existing properties. Next slide, please. Uh, what did staff do here? Um, so the city's consultant on the project optimized the PIC design and developed two additional options. Uh, we adjusted the boulevard widths where feasible, reviewed tree removals with forestry staff and reduced the impact of the retaining wall. Next slide, please. Design option one is optimization of the PIC design with a boulevard of 1.6, 1.0 to 1.6 meters, which includes the removal of four trees, driveway lengths reduced by 2.5 to 3.1 meters, reduced retaining wall impacts, four street light poles and utility infrastructure uh, required to be relocated. And this cost $180,000 which we fully funded by the Cambridge West developers. Next slide, please. Option number two shown in blue is the installation of a sidewalk with a continuous bullard of 1.0 meters, which includes the driveway lengths being reduced by 2.5 meters, relocation of 12 street light poles and utility infrastructure. Uh, this, um, cost $295,000, $115,000 additional funds would be required. Um, this option has the same impact on trees and the retaining wall as option one. Next slide, please. Design option th three shown in yellow is the installation of a 1.0 meter curb face sidewalk, which includes, includes a driveway lengths being reduced by 1.8 meters, 13 street lights, poles and utility infrastructure being relocated. And uh, the cost of this option is $315,000 where $135,000 additional funds would be required. Uh, this option has the same impact on trees in the retaining wall as option one and two does. Also this option will have impacts on public works operations for snow clearing of the sidewalk. Next slide, please. Uh, staff recommends that the preferred design option one proceed to tender and construction, which includes a 1.5 meter bullard sidewalk on the northwest side of Newman Drive, a uh, varying bullard width of 1.0 to 1.6 meters, removal of four trees, a new retaining wall, and fully funded from developers. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, and are there any questions? 
Well, thank you, Dennis. And before we go to questions, we're going to hear the rest of our delegates, and then we will come back and ask questions after the entire presentation has been completed. So I see Councillor Wolf has a question, but if you can just hold on to that, then we'll come back to them at the end of the delegations. And we do have three delegations tonight. Um, so if you would bear with me, that's what we'll do. Thank you, Dennis, for the presentation. And as I said, we have three delegates. Our first delegate on the list is Joanna Stein. And we'll just take a moment to get uh, Joanna on the line. Hello, Joanna. Hello. Joanna, it's uh, Councillor Mike Mann here. Can you just turn the background noise down? And before, um, we, and before we get started, I just have some guidelines that I want to share with you before we get going. Sure. Well, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And a reminder to you that you do have five minutes to address council. And please ensure that your remarks relate directly to the agenda item that you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask you to end your comments. We do have rules of engagement in council, and we ask that you ensure your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. A reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item that you are speaking to. I'll advise you when your five minutes is up, and uh, when four minutes have occurred, you'll hear a bell in the background, and when completed, uh, council may have questions of you at that time. So it's uh, welcome to this evening's meeting and uh, it's your turn to speak, Joanna, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Deputy Mayor Mann and all the members of council for allowing me for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Joanna Stein and my husband and I own a home on Newman Drive at the beginning of the proposed sidewalk extension project. We are new residents to Cambridge. We're expats from Toronto and we were drawn to our West Galt neighborhood and to Newman Drive specifically because of its abundant tree canopy, its obvious pride of ownership, and its unique character. As the development of the Cambridge West community subdivision moves forward, it seems that the city has, after 60 years, deemed a sidewalk as necessary. Out of the 17 homeowners who will be directly affected by the sidewalk installation, 11 voiced their concerns about the project during the public information presentation held in January. And we stand with them in agreement that option three is the only option that adequately addresses all of our residential concerns. We are asking council to reevaluate the design impact scoring system prepared by Mr. Lopez or Lopes. Mr. Lopes ranking system double dips by separating the impact of the utility infrastructure and the cost to relocate said infrastructure, essentially giving double weight to the same consideration. When you merge those two line items, then option one and option three become equal in point value, pitting a one-time cost for the city against the continuing negative impact of the 17 homeowners that will be affected. Additionally, we at 55 Newman Drive have an additional concern as our property is facing major changes to the character of our home and its curb appeal. According to the proposed plan, it will be necessary to install a two foot high by 65 foot long retaining wall along the entire street facing line of our yard. While we understand that in every plan a retaining wall remains necessary, in option three, the retaining wall may be substantially reduced in length, thereby lessening its impact to both our property and to the cost of the city. We've had a brief discussion with Mr. Lopes about the installation, and we were told that it would be built according to the city's engineering standards. However, we are concerned that both the construction material and the design are not suitable for a residential neighborhood. The references we were provided with are mostly on busy city arteries, and the look and feel are decidedly institutional. We then requested to see examples of where these walls have been installed in front of a home on a residential side street, but received no response. We even presented Mr. Lopes with five 
alternate design options that we feel are more in keeping with the character of our property and the neighborhood as a whole. Again, no response. As such, we find it reasonable to request that council vote yes to adding an amendment, regardless of which plan is agreed upon, directing the engineering department and Stantec Consulting to work with us to come to a compromise that won't negatively affect our property value, will be aesthetically pleasing, and will not be substantially more costly to the city. This city's continuing growth is exciting and invigorating, but it shouldn't come at the expense of existing property owners and taxpayers who have chosen to make Cambridge their home. Thank you all for your time and your consideration of this issue. Thank you for your delegation, Joanna. And, and uh, just before you leave, are there any questions that council has of Joanna at this time? I do see some. Uh, first is Councillor Hamilton, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Mann, and thank you very much, Joanna, for your uh, delegation. I'm just wondering when you're talking about the aesthetics or the design of, of what you're envisioning, can you describe uh, if, if your own personal design differs from what you see today, what, what would that look like? What would the difference be? Absolutely. Um, one of the design options that we presented continues to use concrete stone slabs, but they are of um, different, differing size and color, um, and they are much less uh, institutional feeling. So that would be one way that we would go, um, and it's the most cost-effective way of doing that. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Joanna. I don't see any other questions and uh, I want to thank you for being a delegate tonight. You are welcome to continue to watch the remainder of our meeting on the City of Cambridge YouTube channel if you would like. So thanks again for being part of the meeting. Thank you very much. Our next delegate is David Thomas and we will take a moment to get David uh, to join us. Sorry, the next one is David Stone. The third one is David Thomas. So we'll go to David Stone first. Thank you very much. Hello, David. Hello. David, if you could just turn the background noise down and uh, we'll sure. be able to move ahead. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Councillor Mike Mann and I wanna thank you for joining us this evening. Before we get started, I have some guidelines that I, I just want to share with you before we move into your presentation or your, your, your presentation. Just a yeah. reminder that you have five minutes to address council, and uh, we'd ask that you please ensure your comments and remarks relate directly to the agenda item that you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may need to end your remarks. Uh, we do have rules of engagement in council meetings, and we ask that you ensure that your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. A reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item you are speaking to. And I'll advise you when your five minutes is up, at which time council may have questions for you, and at the four minute mark, you will hear a warning bell in the background. So it's yours, David, and please uh, go ahead and uh, tell us what you want to tell us. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, I've uh, thank you for everyone's time. Uh, Joanna did a great job at covering a lot of the issues, so I'll uh, I'll save everyone's time by just covering any additional notes that I think are uh, of value. Uh, I will add that I think uh, Mike, you and I have had some dealings before where you actually helped me to remove a sidewalk. And uh, I think I'm probably the only resident in Cambridge that uh, has had a sidewalk both removed and added. So maybe that gives me a little bit of unique uh, sidewalk experience. Um, as Joanna mentioned, the sidewalk that uh, is being proposed in option one uh, does have the largest impact to the residents and the people living here. 
Um, I have kind of uh, tried to make myself uh, somebody that acts on behalf of the homeowners. And um, I have heard uh, a lot of their voices, uh, as Joanna mentioned, um, looking to have option three be their option of choice. Um, it does have the lowest impact for the homeowners that are here. And um, I do also share, I was surprised that Joanna also noticed the, the point system as well there. Um, I did notice the same thing, that the point system does seem to be skewed uh, in such a way as to give design one an advantage over design three um, in the fact of, of the scoring. So that was, that was great that she was able to point that out. Um, So I, I guess I, you know, kind of in closing, I would agree with with Joanne in terms of uh, in terms of the option that is proposed for number three. Uh, what Dennis, I guess, didn't cover is, um, you know, we, there was a request that was put out to get feedback from residents regarding um, how they felt about the plan, what their concerns were, um, you know, in terms of property value damage and how it impacts their living. I myself uh, barely have four parking spots, those could potentially be cut to two. Um, so I would like to add for council to note that uh, design option number one does very little to address any of the concerns of the residents on Newman Drive. Um, whereas design three does the most um, to, uh, to address those. So that is the one thing that, uh, you know, Dennis did a good presentation and I have had uh, a lot of interactions with him uh, in this process. And um, I think that just might be the one piece that the council is missing here. Design one is being presented as uh, the best option because it's free to Cambridge, um, but it's not the option that the residents on Newman Drive want to see. And uh, me personally with the, you know, there is a very large impact that's going to come from the development up the street. The majority of that is going to be a negative impact on the people that live on Newman Drive. And my personal viewpoint is there should be some obligation for balance on the city's behalf, uh, considering the tax revenue that's gonna be generated up the street and the money that the developer is putting in to support this project, that an option really should be chosen to limit the impact on the residents on Newman Drive who are already going to receive quite a negative impact as a result of this subdivision. So that would be my, my final consideration to take into account is, is a type of balance um, to the effect of the people here on Newman Drive. Well, thank you, David. And uh, I do remember the, uh, the sidewalk removal that we did uh, over in Preston. Uh, I do yeah. have uh, a couple of councillors who have some questions for you. And the first one is Councillor Adshade. Please go ahead, Councillor Adshade. Oh, thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor. David, thanks for your presentation, you and Joanna. Uh, what I'm not sure of, David, is you and Joanna mentioned that you felt that the scoring wasn't fair, that there's uh, favoritism towards option one. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Could you could you explain that to me, please? Sure. Well, if I look at the if I look at the scoring, um, two points. One is there's there's a there's a scoring for utility infrastructure, which obviously is the impact it's going to have to city infrastructure, and then there's a separate. Um, points deducted for the cost to remove it. So even though option two, for example, is going to have no long-term effect on, on infrastructure, it is going to need to change, um, it, it gets double dipped a bit where, you know, three points are added for the infrastructure impact and then points are also added for some of the cost implications of those changes. So, um, you know, that kind of uh, is what she means by the double dipping and I would agree. Um, and I would also note that you know, the existing tree can canopy and landscape, which is, you know, that design scoring is supposed to mark the impact on homeowners. Um, it's not feasible for design one and design three to have the same score. Um, the majority of the, of the homeowners here are very unhappy with design one. Uh, for design three to rece receive the same point score of having that impact on a ham homeowners, it just, it just shows that, you know, that scoring really wasn't thought through. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Adshade. And now we have Councillor Reed, please. Go ahead, Councillor Reed. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So the, the one that you like the best has curbside sidewalk, which means 
that there's no boulevard. Am I correct in that? Uh, yeah, you're correct. I mean, the the of the houses on Newman Drive here, they're not all affected evenly. Um, you know, half the street's not even going to get a sidewalk, so there's not a big issue there. Um, but a lot of the residences on the south side they have very tight driveways and front lawns. Uh, I mean, maybe not by new subdivision standards, but definitely by the standards of this neighborhood. So um, I myself have like a two and a, a two and a half car driveway, I guess I would say. And the difference between the sidewalk at the curb and the sidewalk encroaching is, you know, me having room for 2.1 cars or 1.9. And, you know, you can see that little difference having, having quite an impact. Yes. So uh, would it be fair to say that, that uh, curbside sidewalks are not as safe as those with boulevards? Uh, I, I, would, I guess I would tend to disagree. The sidewalk itself is actually wider. So um, I don't see any reason. If you were to go to uh, Blair, which is just uh, one street over. That is a much busier street than ours. And it has curbside sidewalks all the way along with no issues. So I don't really think that would be, that would be a consideration. In the end, you're going to end up with a wider sidewalk, which is, I would think, a benefit to the people using it. Okay. And, and uh, now I've forgotten what my third question was. Well, I'll go on to others. And if I think of it, I'll come back. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, and I don't have any others. But I do thank you, David, for your presentation and for being part of our, our uh, evening. Uh, and you're more than welcome to watch the remainder of the meeting on the Cambridge YouTube site if you would like to. So thanks for being thanks. part of the night. Thanks, it's very exciting. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Our next delegate is David Thomas, and uh, we'll just take a moment to get David Thomas on the line. Hello, David. Yeah. If you could just turn the volume down in the background. Yes. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is uh, Councillor Mike Mann, and I want to thank you for joining us as a delegate uh, tonight. And before we get started, there are just some guidelines that I want to share with you. A reminder sure. that you have five minutes to address council, and please ensure that your remarks relate directly to the agenda item that you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your remarks. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure that your comments are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. A reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item that you were speaking to. I will advise when you have when your five minutes is up at which time council may have questions and you may hear a, a bell in the background at the four minute mark just to warn you. So welcome to the meeting and you have five minutes to present. Deputy Mayor Mann and members of council, uh, my name is David Thomas. I live with my family at 47 Newman Drive. Uh, we've been in this home for about 28 years. We've raised our three daughters in the home and uh, we not only love our home, but also the neighborhood and our neighbors. Uh, we're strong proponents of an active lifestyle. We walk daily in our neighborhood. I'm sure all of our neighbors know us as the walkers. Um, I extend thanks to the city uh, staff, uh, in particular Dennis and, and my counselor, Pam Wolf. All of my requests for information were answered in a prompt and professional manner. So thank you very much for that. I'll admit I was not happy when the sidewalk was announced. Um, we love our large lot. We take excellent care of the city's land. It sits in front of our home. And the thought of a ribbon of concrete across the lawn, especially 1.5 meters wide, was very upsetting. Um, but over time, I guess I've come to accept the inevitable and I certainly see the benefits of, you know, better pedestrian safety, especially with the new development. I see there are three options in front of council. My recommendation is design option three with the curb face sidewalk. In my opinion, it will have the least impact on the character of our neighborhood and our individual properties. This design also preserves the maximum number of driveway parking spots. Keeping our cars in the driveways and off the street will improve the safety on the street, especially near the bend in front.
front of 25 Newman and all the way down the hill to Princess Street. That's a very steep hill, especially in the winter. My second choice is design option one. That's the staff option. This option is the one recommended by city um, staff. It's a compromise, I believe, to meet the developer's contribution to cost. If option one is chosen, I must ask that our city staff work really close with the contractor and the homeowner to ensure the sidewalk is really well placed and well graded on each of our properties. Um, perhaps the areas that are targeted for a 1.6 meter boulevard could be kept a little bit closer to one meter or 1.4 meters wherever possible. And I know Dennis thought that that could be done. Um, I also have a few uh, tree concerns. Um, first, I would like the tree in front of 51 Newman to be retained. It may not be a perfect uh, specimen of a tree, but uh, heck, who's perfect in this world? I know I'm not. So to save one more tree might be a good idea to preserve that character of the neighborhood. Um, if you do remove that particular tree, I'd like the city to plant a replacement tree nearby in the city boulevard. Uh, second, I see that the sidewalk will be installed over the roots of numerous trees that sit on private land. I'm gonna call those the private trees. I have one such private tree on my lawn. There's another private tree on my neighbor's lawn adjacent to my driveway. And I would like our city staff to carefully monitor the contractor to ensure those private trees have the best chance of survival. And if a private tree dies or withers due to sidewalk construction, and I'd like the city to commit to remove that tree and plant a new one. Thanks for the opportunity to speak and I welcome any questions or comments. Thank you for your presentation, David. And uh, I will ask council if they have any questions, uh, questions of you at this time. And seeing none, we do want to thank you again for being a, a delegate at this, evening's eve at this evening's meeting. And you're more than welcome to continue watching the remainder of our meeting on the Cam City of Cambridge YouTube channel, if you like. Thank you, David. Thank you. And hearing from our registered delegations this evening, we will now have council place the item on the floor prior to discussion. So Councillor Devine, you have the motion. Uh, oh, before we go there, Councillor Liggett, I think you had a, have a question. Uh, I did. We were going to have questions of staff. Yes, we will as soon as we put the motion on the floor. Okay, sorry. Oh, fine. Uh, so, Councillor Devine, I believe you have the motion. Could you please read it in its entirety? Yes, Councillor Mann, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Newman Drive sidewalk installation, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Edshed. Recommendation that report 21-071 bracket CD Newman Drive sidewalk installation be received by council. And further, Newman Drive sidewalk design one option as outlined in this report proceed towards tender and construction in 2021. And I'd like to speak on it, please. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, looked, I looked through the report and I, I have to give a uh, Mr. Lopes of the engineering department credit. Um, you know, we, we can say the numbers are skewed and the priorities are skewed, but you know, wh what I've seen, what I've seen here, um, the number one makes the most sense to me. The number one, yeah, there's, and every time we, we get into sidewalk installation, road construction, um, occasionally somebody will lose a little bit at the end of their driveway but in all honesty, they're not really losing in some case because it wasn't theirs, it was city property to begin with. And when you put sidewalks in and do infrastructure, I mean, that's, that's what happens. And Newman is, is a lovely area. But the one thing that has always concerned me, um, I, I'm a big fan of a wider boulevard because it's safer, it's cleaner, it's neater. Uh, if a sidewalk, if a vehicle comes up over the street, they've got you know, more distance to get to the sidewalk. 
The, I don't think in this this case the curb face sidewalk is going to be effective. Um, and cosmetically, in the summer months, it looks so so much better. And because we get into the, the narrow boulevards, we we've had we got some boulevards here that are I don't think they're foot. Well, you, you, you couldn't grow, you can't even grow crabgrass on them because they dry out so bad. But you get a meter, meter and a bit, and it ma makes for a nice boulevard and cosmetically it looks good. And uh, up on the west side, I think cosmetics is huge. And I, I think that boulevard is very important. And financially, um, it, it, the, you know, the numbers work, the numbers balance. So I, I'm certainly in favor of the option number one. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move on to... Uh questions and uh, and comments and i know councillor wolf you have uh, your hand up please go ahead uh through you deputy mayor uh this is a question for dennis um dennis would it be possible to work with the homeowner um about choosing the retaining wall uh through you, through the chair uh yes we can work with the homeowner uh to look at other designs for the retaining wall um, what I will um, say is that the reason why we did chose our standard Grande wall is that is what it's currently installed in the neighborhood. Uh, there is areas on Blair Road, uh, Princess Street, and Blenheim Road that have this current design installed. Um, also, with the um, retaining walls being placed to protect some of the utility infrastructure that we are going to impact because of grading changes, so we wanted to keep it to a standard. So if there is any work that ever has to be done uh, at that location, that our staff are uh, knowledgeable on that retaining wall and that any repairs could be completely uh, completed by staff. But you're still open to looking at other designs? Yes. Okay, um, thank you. And I'll comment later after questions. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Councillor Liggett, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dennis, um, this is quite a substantial lopping off of the driveways uh, with option one, it's eight to 10 feet versus six for option number three. Is there any future um, uh, plans to remove any of the on-street parking currently on Newman? Uh, through the chair, currently there is no um, future plans to remove uh, on-street parking from Newman Drive. Okay. I also, without measuring, I believe it does meet our standard for parking on both sides of the street. Okay, thank you. Any further questions of staff from council? Uh, Councillor Hamilton, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, sorry, thank you, Deputy Mayor Mann, and uh, through you, uh, I guess this question might be for Cheryl, uh, but it seemed like the majority of, of residents that called in tonight seem to favor option number three, uh, which would add $135,000 to the 180, so making the overall cost uh, about $315,000, uh, if I'm correct. Where, uh, if, if option three would have, let's say, been the preferred option, where would that have come from? Uh, because the 180 would have come from the developer, so the remaining 135,000 is there any way to get more from the developer for that or what, what, where would that have come from the city? Through you, Deputy Mayor Mann. Um, I'm not sure about your question if there's a possibility of getting more funding from the developer. If that's not the case, then we would have to draw funding from one of the city's reserves, likely the Capital Works Reserve. Right, thank you, that answers my question. Thank you. The next uh, question is from Councillor Reed. please. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. So if we were to choose option three, the curbside sidewalk, then the city would be responsible for snow removal of that sidewalk. And I'm wondering uh, if uh, Ms. Ayers would have any idea, or anyone else for that matter, of how much that would typically cost uh, in a winter. I'm not sure at this time what our cost per kilometer is for snow removal on sidewalks. I'm not sure if any other staff might have that figure. Perhaps Yogesh Shah might be able to answer that question. Thank you. And I do see Yogesh wanting to speak. Please, Yogesh, go ahead. 
I don't have the cost uh, handy with me, so I won't be able to provide the cost, but it, it's an operational concern uh, and the snow storage space uh, and the safety during the winter. So that would be a concern for sure with the, the curved face boulevard, curved face okay. sidewalk. So where would we store the, the snow? It would be on the sidewalk and the sidewalk would be narrowed in that case. Uh, and, and that would, the, with the freeze and um, thaw of the, the snow, it would create some kind of an icy condition at times too. So that creates an operational challenges for the staff for sure, in addition to the cost. Okay, so um, my concern earlier about it, curbside not being as safe as, as uh, is a true ism, I might add. It's Thank not the you. best option. We have at some places, but it's not the best option for staff to consider. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, moving on, we have uh, uh, Councillor Wolf, please go ahead. Um, through um, Deputy Mayor, are we into uh, comments now? Yes, we are now. So please go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank staff for um, all the work they've done on this um, project. Uh, as you know, originally there were 12 trees being removed. Now there are only four. Um, and I believe one of those four is at the request of a homeowner because it's not a healthy tree. Um, and also uh, thank the developers who, um, as part of our negotiations with Cambridge West, are paying the $180,000 for this sidewalk. Originally they were paying 70, now 180. So, so those are um, really good things. At the same time, I'm sympathetic to the homeowners. This is an established area and uh, a beautiful street. And they are, have well-developed properties and the majority of them would prefer the curbside sidewalk. Um, it has the least impact on the neighborhood, uh, least impact on their gardens, et cetera. And uh, so I would prefer option three, though I am appreciative of all the work that's gone into option one. Thank you, Councillor Wolf. And any other comments from Council? Seeing no further count, no, no further comments. I'll uh, now ask the clerk to call for the vote. Madam Clerk, please. Councillor Adchate. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Meta. Aye. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. Opposed. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. Opposed. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is item number 7.3.3. Report 21-001, the Bishop Street Community Update. And Councillor Rometta, you have the motion. Please read it in its entirety. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I do, I'm just looking for it. Oh, here it is, okay. It's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reed. The recommendation that report 21-001 CD, Bishop Street Community Update be received. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff? Councillor Devine. Yes, yeah, to the chair, Councillor Um, I really appreciate the work that staff went to with this report and bringing it to council's attention. This uh, area of the city has been an issue uh, from Triclethene 111 for some time. Uh, when North, North Star had it, and you know, and the previous people had it prior to that, and we have a number of residents, two, two three, four hundred in that area, that uh, have concerns, and a number of them have, have pumps in their 
their basement that are being monitored on a regular basis. And I see the most recent update from the ministry, and this is a ministry responsibility, is my understanding, and not a city responsibility. The re most recent update uh, that's been put out to the general public, I believe, was November 2019. And it's fine to say, you know, it's online, it's this, but you know, that, that's an older neighborhood. <laughs> a lot of those folks don't have computers. And I don't, I don't recall the last time they had a community meeting. So I, I would like to give direction to the clerk that the clerk be directed to send correspondence on behalf of council requesting the following. That the ministry hold another public information meeting to update the public on the current situation of TCE contamination of the Bishop Street community. That the ministry hold public information meetings at least once every two years to update the Bishop Street community. And number three, and further that the ministry advise Cambridge Council and the public of the current mitigation plans for the area, given that the pump and treatment system noted in the staff report concluded in 2015. So I'd like the city clerk to do that, please, because this, this is concerning in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Devine. And next we have Councillor Liggett. Councillor Liggett, please. Uh, am I to assume that there was no staff presentation on this? Did I miss a staff presentation? No, you're correct. There was just the report. Okay, um, I'm, I'm disappointed because this is being brought to us because I had requested that a, a presentation be given to council so the public could see that presentation. Uh, I see Elaine is- hands Yes, up. There yes. Is just, just, before, just, okay. just, before, just before you go ahead, then we will ask uh, Ms. Brumshaw okay. if she would address that for us. Thank you, Ms. Brumshaw. Okay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So uh, we are aware of the request. We did work with provincial staff and um, their preference was to provide a report. They are the experts in this matter. And as acknowledged, this is, a, is not a, a specific city matter, but we are providing you with the current information. So the uh, proposed mo motion from Councillor Devine, if endorsed by council, will provide an opportunity to circle back to the province on these matters. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brunshaw. Um, so I, I had concerns. The reason I wanted this brought forward is because it had been so long, uh, the timing in between um, the last public meeting that was held, a town hall type meeting that had been held by the ministry and the consultants. And I felt that this is such an important matter that we needed to be asking for this. So. I, um, I, I understand what Ms. Brunshaw is saying, but I'm, I'm very disappointed that the ministry uh, didn't see fit to do something themselves, considering the contamination that, that has been going on forever and a day here. So I think that, and, and this isn't the fault of our staff, this is absolutely the ministry. Um, and I appreciate the report. Uh, but I agree with Councillor Devine, uh, this needs to be brought forward in a public forum so that the people can ask the types of questions they asked in the last one. Um, Councillor Manu and I both attended that, I remember, and there was quite a few people at that one. And I think we probably have a very high attendance again. So I, I would like to, uh, uh, that direction of Councillor Devine's to go forward to staff as well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, any other questions or comments from council? And just before we call for the vote, I too agree with the direction that uh, Councillor Devine has requested uh, staff to take. Um, it has been a long time since the ministry has provided any feedback to the community and you're absolutely right, Councillor, to get away. We were at that meeting and there was a fair number of people from the community because they are very concerned about knowing what is and what isn't in their in their neighborhoods. So I support that uh, recommendation by Councillor Devine as well. And uh, that is a uh, staff recommendation that you are providing, Councillor Devine? Sorry, direction to staff? Yeah, yeah that, that's direction. Uh... Okay, what, how I have this uh, word written up here, that clerk be directed to set correspondence on behalf of council requesting the following. Okay, so that, that effectively goes to, uh, um, you know, through the clerk goes the ministry. 
or direct it whichever way we see fit through that through city staff. And like, you know, unless you want a little firm, I can just change it and make it a pure motion. But I, I think direction to staff will work fine, uh, Councilor Man. Thank because, you. Because, quite honestly, I think staff's done anything they can do. The ministry, I believe, has to come to the pump. The, the staff did a great report, great report. But the ministry is not, not partaking in the party. Thank you. We'll take that as direction to staff then. Seeing no further questions or comments, then I'll uh, now ask the clerk to call for the vote. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Mehta. Favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. The next item on our agenda, we have item number 7.3.4, and that's report 21-089, additional building division staff. And this report was previously distributed on March 30th, but was moved to, the, to this evening's meeting. Councillor Liggett, I believe you have the motion. Would you read it in its entirety, please? I will. Who's my seconder? Councillor Wolf. Okay, thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Wolf, that report 21-089 CD, additional building division staff be received and that the building division increases its staffing complement of municipal building officials by two full-time uh, employees to manage increased volume of permit activity. And if I could speak to this, please. Yes, please go ahead. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, in in uh, my, uh, my uh, employment, my, my business, uh, we hear quite a bit about um, holding up of um, permits. And I know our staff are, are working very, very diligently to accommodate all of this. Uh, I think some of the complaints that I hear from clients are, you know, might be old ones as the uh, perceived um, um, uh, speed of which <laughs> permits are, are issued. Uh, and I do understand the process. So I think anything we can do to make it uh, seem as if that our community is receptive to uh, 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 developers coming in or people uh, building new houses or adding on to their, their structures that they have now, that all increases the tax base. So with that increase in the tax base, it's easy to make up for the employment of, of extra people. So I, uh, I'm fully in support of this. Thank you, Councillor Leggett. Uh, we'll move on to Councillor Wolf, please. Go ahead. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, I too uh, strongly support this motion. Um, I, with all the new subdivisions uh, going forward and even uh, people uh, <laughs> with COVID trying to renovate their own homes and doing all different projects, we uh, definitely need more staff uh, in our building division. Um, one point I might ask staff to consider is when we're hiring people um, to hire some with, um, if they can, experience in inspecting uh, homes that have environmental features. Um, a few years ago, I was at a, a um, sort of a conference and the developers spoke and they said one of their reasons why they didn't wanna put in different uh, environmental features in homes, for instance, gray water systems, solar pan panels, et cetera, was because it took much longer to get uh, those homes inspected because inspectors often didn't have experience. So, um, if we can um, keep that in uh, in mind when we're hiring an inspector, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Wolf, and we'll move on to Councillor Devine. Thank you, through the chair, Councillor Man. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the uh, bringing on two additional staff. 
And I want to give uh, credit to staff and particularly Mr. Purcell. I mean, that's extremely well written report. Well written and well thought out. Um, and it's, it's revenue neutral and it's thinking of the future of the city. But I just, I would like to plant a seed here. I would like to plant to see it here with the deputy managers and the manager. Um, we are very proud of the heritage we have in our community, the heritage buildings. And it's my belief that um, it's very difficult to have a building inspector running from uh, a new build, say the Madame subdivision, and then running down to uh, uh, East, East Main and Galt and dealing with a, a heritage building. I do believe that we are almost at a point in time today, and again, it's planting the seed, that we need one inspector, one inspector only, to deal with heritage building issues. Thank you. Thank you, and moving on to Councillor Adshay, please go ahead. Thanks, Deputy Mayor, and uh, I'm in full support of this motion. Uh, when we look at all the new subdivisions that are being built, the hospital uh, uh, construction, uh, the gaslight, where we really need in great need of um, additional planners. And um, basically, uh, when you look when you look at the situ when you look at the situation, we're already paying thousands of dollars in overtime and consultants fees. So I'm really in support of this uh, of this motion. Thank you, Councillor Edshade. And moving on to Councillor Liggett, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would not have thought of what uh, Councillor Devine and Councillor Wolf have, have uh, asked for here. And I think that that's very forward thinking of both of them. And I concur, uh, we need somebody who understands the advances in uh, environmental systems and uh, also the loss uh, you know, of some of our past um, buildings, uh, the, the knowledge of what it, uh, what it takes to um, uh, keep those buildings in, in shape and, and how new, new attach, um, renovations are done and, and uh, new additions onto some of these older buildings. I think it's, uh, it's a very good thing to have. So we're at the same time, we're looking forward with what Councillor Wolf is asking. We're looking to the past with Councillor Devine and I think it's a, it's a great uh, blend of both. So I concur with both of them on that. That would be great. Thank you, Councillor Liggett. And uh, are there any other questions or comments from Council? Seeing none, I do have a, a couple of questions myself. And I, I read the report and I knew that uh, there was money available uh, for this through the uh, uh, planning budget. But I wanna know uh, how sustainable is this into the future and does it affect our budget, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the impact on our on our city budget into the future. So if, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bromberg, if you could answer that question for me, please go ahead. Yeah, through through you, Deputy Mayor Mann, um, it's important to, to realize that the cost of these two additional building inspectors uh, have no impact on the tax base. This is purely from the users that um, are looking for building permits. Um, the cost is covered through our building permit fees. Uh, we do have a reserve fund that is in excess of $3 million. Um, that reserve fund is called the Building Stabilization Rate Fund, and that is not to be used for any other purposes except for the administration and enforcement of the Building Code Act. And so that's where we would take the money. We do expect to have revenues in excess of our expenses this year again, um, likely contributing to additional um, funds towards that reserve fund. So again, the, the important um, piece of information that I want to share is that this has no impact on the tax base or for our operating budget. Thank you. And just for clarification on that, will it have an impact on the operating budget into the future or will the uh, cost for the FTEs always come out of that building uh, stabilization fund? So, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say what it looks like in 20 years, but in 20 years, there, there is lots of opportunity to adjust the staff resources towards the needs in the building division. Um, at this point, um, we do, as I said, have a healthy reserve fund 
And um, if you're looking at about $3 million over the last five years, we've averaged over just around $500,000 a year contribution towards that reserve fund. This is $170,000 extra cost per year. So um, well within the, the additional fees that uh, the users are paying. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Ayers, if you wanted to add in, please. Thank you. And um, to you, Deputy Mayor Mann, I also just wanted to add that um, Council may recall that they had approved for staff to do a user fee review that was approved through the 2020 budget. So we're currently working on that and expect to be bringing that to Council within the next couple of months for approval. But as part of that review, we are looking at our building permit fees and we will ensure that we are um, appropriately collecting the full amount of money we need to cover off our staff resources. And through that study, we'll also look at the sustainability of that reserve and making sure that there is no impact and our fees are set appropriately. Very good, thank you very much for that. And uh, to the rest of council, are there any questions that I've created from that? The one thing I will say is that uh, what we did do was uh, when we asked for cost containment initiatives to be implemented back in 2020, we, we looked at all our staffing and we said that we weren't going to hire any staffing in order to meet the, the uh, cost containment initiatives that we wanted to as a result of this pandemic. And the explanation that uh, staff have provided tonight uh, allows me to support what's being presented, but at the same time being very mindful that other areas within the city have uh, foregone staff increases because of cost containment initiatives. So I just wanted to make that known tonight as well and that we recognize that. And if there are no further questions or comments at this time, then I will ask uh, the clerk to call the, call the question. Madam Clerk, please. Councillor Adshade. Favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. And the next item on our agenda, we have number seven. 21-059, the request from the Hindu community to scatter cremated human remains in the Grand River. We do have one delegation tonight on this item. We have Prakash Venkatariaman with us, and we'll take a moment to get Prakash to join us. Thank you. And Prakash? The next item on our agenda. Yes. Yeah. Can you just turn? I think you got it. Thanks, Prakash. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's Mike, no it's uh, Councillor Mike Mann with you this evening, and thank you for joining us to get delegate. And just before you get started, we have a couple of guidelines that we want to explain. Okay. As a reminder, you have five minutes to address council, so please ensure that your comments relate directly to the agenda item you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your remarks. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure that your comments are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. And a reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item that you are speaking to. I'll advise you when your five minutes are up, there, you will hear a bell ring in the background at four minutes, but uh, after the five minutes, council may have questions of you. So the, it's, uh, the, you have five minutes to speak and I welcome you to make your presentation, Prakash. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I am Prakash Rangat Raman. Please accept my sincere gratitude for the opportunity extended to be a delegation before this distinguished panel of council and staff. Being a multicultural country envied by many citizens of other nations, Canada and Canadians have embraced its citizens' unique cultural traits, celebration of their individual religions festivities, which we all rejoice as one big family and explore other cultures and the same extent to when losing a loved one. We understand death only after it has placed its hands on someone we love. Dealing with death is a process. Getting through the loss of a loved one takes time and everyone's journey to healing is unique. Even though losing a loved one is never easy, 
the right support and guidance can help you get through it. Life must continue, and you will grow from the loss and learn to live with it. With various religions and beliefs in practice in our big nation, funeral services differ according to different practices. For religions in which cremation is followed, the remains are always to be treated with respect. I would like to bring it to this panel that in this agenda, it says the request from Hindu community. It is on behalf of community at large in Cambridge. Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, and few other religious followers practice cremating their loved ones, followed by scattering of ashes ceremony in water body. I have numerous family friends of Christianity faith, and some of them do cremate and scatter ashes in the water body as well. Currently, some do scatter ashes in the Grand River, but with guilt or fear, as we do not have a clear permit-free status allowing or prohibiting on this practice. In the last seven months, I have represented and discussed with many level of government to discuss on this important request from the community at large. What I have found out and reflected in the report submitted by staff that all levels of government claim it is not in their juris jurisdiction when it comes to the ownership of Grand River. City jurisdiction stops with the shore and GRCA monitors the water flow only and province doesn't own the river or the land beneath it. So it's a gray area, very unique situation we have. PAO, province of Ontario, allows cremated remains to be permitted for scattering on crown land, the Great Lakes, provincial parks, conservation reserves, and waterways. We do not have any lakes or provincial park with water body within the region of Waterloo. For families living al along the banks of Grand River, Scattering of ashes in a body of water with permit-free status enables the bereaved families to complete the circle of grief closer to home and heart. Lakshai Foundation, together with numerous citizens from the community and organizations, have extended to donate $20,000 or even more based on the requirement to create a shelter closer to the Grand River so that scattering of ashes ceremony could be performed open to public. Staff has suggested in the report, report about potential access point in south of Cambridge where a shelter could be donated, but clearly says it is not their jurisdiction to allow scattering of ashes. Another option suggested is in the parkland cemetery where a garden would be in place to allow uh, this ceremony. But as the belief is to scatter in the body of water, I am not sure how many people would feel comfortable to use this parkland cemetery garden where there would be no access to waterways. On behalf of community at large, I kindly request council to advise staff to recommend a land on the shores of Grand River for the community to create a memory unity park, a memory unity park, where the park area could be duly registered with BAO to perform scattering of ashes and to be used as a memory park. This could be coordinated with various local organizations to maintain and related costs could be shared. If there are no availability of city-owned land with access point for this purpose, I request council to inquire and report on GRCA or region-owned property on the shores of Grand River to be used for this purpose. I really appreciate with sincere gratitude for your serious consideration to make this cultural final right ritual, enabling the closer of many grieving families of Canadians and new Canadians who embrace Canada as their home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prakash, very much. And uh, I'm looking to Council for questions, and I do have some. Our first question is from Councillor Liggett. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Prakash, thanks for presenting tonight. I, I actually had somebody in the, in the last, uh, I don't know, less than a year who had requested something similar uh, and they had wanted to do it um, not in the Grand but in one of the creeks uh, in the community and I did pass that on to staff at that time. Um, do you know of any other, and he it was not for religious reasons by the way, um, do you know of any other communities in the province that do um, have something set up such as what you're requesting? Uh, through you Chair. 
Uh, yes, uh, there are communities within an uh, hour, hour and a half drive from Cambridge. Uh, they do have these kind of facilities, and they have created these facilities, and uh, it is uh, operational, and the community is extremely happy. Like, they do have in the place where they live, uh, so they could, you know, do the scattering of ashes. Yes. In the waterways, you mean? Yes. Could you tell us which communities those are, please? Uh, starting from Brampton, uh, Hamilton, and uh, uh, there are other areas. Uh, the lakes, uh, conservation parks, uh, all those are already allowed by the province of Ontario and BAO. But when it comes to some of the creeks, uh, uh, I believe like in Brampton and also other areas, uh, staff has done some analysis. Uh, I believe like uh, Mr. Shaw uh, might, might have more uh, understanding and awareness on this. Can I have a follow-up, please, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I, I suspect and I have pretty <laughs> solid beliefs that this gentleman went ahead and did it on his own. Do you think that that's what people are doing on a fairly regular basis, is scattering in the waterways um, because there is nothing set up already? Correct. Uh, through you, Chair, uh, that is correct. And uh, many people are doing it. There are no bylaw uh, prohibiting that or allowing that. So they are doing it with guilt, with the hope like nobody going to see them. That's the last thing we want them to do, like especially when they are doing the final rights. And uh, they need to have a permit-free status so that they can spend that last minute scattering the ashes wholeheartedly without worry and without looking around with guilt. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is uh, Councillor Ameta. Please go ahead. Um, Deputy Mayor, my question was in lines is about what communities already do it, if any. And uh, my other question is, um, is there a site in mind in Cambridge that should be looked at, like River Buffs Park, for example, or other areas with the river access, if it's even allowed, if there's a way that we can get approval. Thank you. Prakash, did you hear the question? Uh, Sorry, uh, the audio was not very clear. Uh, would you mind to repeat that, uh, Councillor Armetta? Sorry. Thank, thank you. Yes, Councillor Armetta, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, thanks, Prakash, for coming in. Uh, my question is, do you have any um, sites in Cambridge in mind that should be given serious consideration? And um, do you think the upper levels of government would be able to assist, whether it's the province or the federal government? I guess that would be my question now. Thanks. Yeah, through you, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Ermeta. Uh, yes, there are uh, at least like three or four spots along the Grand River within Cambridge. And uh, I'm sure uh, we will get support from the provincial government if uh, need be. Uh, and uh, we just need a place, a shelter could be donated and it could be maintained by the community. Uh, we just need a place along the uh, uh, Grand River Shore. For example, right across the Dixon Park and it could be uh, next to, uh, uh, you know, uh, there, are, there are a lot of spots like we discussed with the staff and also uh, with uh, Mr. Calder in the past. Uh, and uh, we, we can identify. So the space, the space, the spot is not important, like anywhere in Cambridge, which is acceptable to the council and the staff is okay. As long as the access to water is there, uh, that's all matters. Everything else is completely flexible and the community is uh, uh, very grateful if this could happen. Thank you, Prakash. And I don't see any other questions right now. So I do wanna thank you for being a part of our delegation this evening. And you're more than welcome to continue to watch the rest of our meeting on the City of Cambridge YouTube site, if you like. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor, man. And uh, uh, thank you for all that you all are doing during this pandemic. Uh, I have to each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. So I think at this point, what we'll do is we'll have the motion put on the floor. And Councillor Reed, you have the motion. Would you please read it in its entirety? 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, I do. It's moved by myself and it's seconded by Council Liggett. The recommendation is that report 21-059 IFS re request to scatter cremated remains in the Grand River be received for information and that council refer to the existing options available to scatter cremated remains in Cambridge and in the province of Ontario. Thank you. And now for uh, questions of staff, uh, Councillor Liggett, please go ahead. Councillor Liggett, can you unmute? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I see Karine is not with us this evening, but um, Mike, you're here to answer questions. I, I would assume on this. Uh, did um, staff, you know, when I look at this motion, there's there's really nothing here other than accepting a report, receiving a report. Um, did staff look at all at any possible locations or going forward and developing a further report or is that something that uh, we can uh, amend the motion for um, to uh, for staff to go forward and look at uh, po potential um, changes to what we have now to allow for this sort of thing in the community um, through deputy mayor man uh, staff did review all the options available and as as in the report uh, requests to the province for scattering of human remains has been uh, reviewed and the province's response is as written in the report. They do permit it within provincial parks, all the Great Lakes uh, and designated areas as, as identified in the reports. So the province has not uh, received or accepted any other requests in, um, uh, of this nature. Other municipalities that we've we've surveyed and spoken to and that we're aware of, where they exist, they are on the shores of the Great Lakes, and the Great Lakes are designated as permitted for scattering human remains, as per the province. We as a municipality don't have the authority to to grant permission to have the uh, for this type of use or any use of the Grand River. In fact, any work that we undertake as a municipality requires permits from the Ministry of Climate and, uh, and Environmental Change, as well as Department of Fisheries in generally consultation or notification to the indigenous communities. So we as a municipality don't have jurisdiction or the ability to, to even perform our own work, uh, let alone grant permission or, or not permission on any other community for any other works. A follow up please, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, so Mike, you would need direction from council to consult with uh, the other agencies and the other levels of government in order to um, have this allowed in our community in the tributaries or the creeks or the Grand River. I'm thinking of, of um, Moyers Landing and Blair as being the perfect location for parking and seclusion, that sort of thing. So is it, is it direction from council, an amendment to this motion, or what would you need? I would think a direction of council were, would be to seek further consultation, but the location at this point probably would not be as relevant uh, until a decision is made or provided to grant that authority for us to grant to provide that permission or another authority to grant permission to this community to do that. Okay, Mr. Chair, I you know I'm I'm quite willing to. Um, suggest that same direction if if we don't amend the motion to do that so and before and before you go on, on I, I like i like the idea but i do know that other counselors want to speak and i want to hear from them as well and then i can come back to you sure thank you uh counselor hamilton please go ahead thank you deputy mayor man and, and through you um i suppose this question might be to mike but I know um, what Prakash is, is proposing is somewhat unique, uh, at least in terms of my understanding, um, because rivers obviously flow. You can't limit them within one particular geographic area or municipality because they will flow out to a larger body of water. But it seems that we do have things on the river, right? Like we have different treatment plants and different facilities, um, and those are allowed. So what is the process for those facilities to be operable on the river and is there any way to use those as some type of a baseline or a model through which to um, to follow up on, on Councillor Liggett's um, 
uh, proposal because it seems that um, from my understanding the process of, of cremation doesn't leave any any harmful wastes um, it, this seems like a question of, of jurisdiction and flow um, so how do those those things we have on the river operate um, successfully because we have them and is there any way to use those as models or templates for what's being discussed right now Great, through Councillor uh, De uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Mann, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, in fact, we, we do have many things like that. They are all done through a certificate of authorization through the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, as well as the Department of Fisheries. All of those facilities that uh, we have to ask permission and under what conditions may we be enabled to operate. All of those will have very specific conditions, such as monitoring the outfall and the contaminants or, or the materials being placed into the river and the limits on which we can in terms of volume and, and quantity of, of those contaminants. Um, in fact, we, we, we a same process goes whether we're adding a dock or any kind of structure on within the water course at all. That, that's the only options we have at this time. And all of them will also require consultation uh, with the Indigenous communities. Thank you. So we, we don't have the authority to, to to, to grant permission to ourselves to install <laughs> any of these facilities. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, thank, thank you for that, Mike, and thank you for the question, Scott. Uh, Councillor Liggett, I know you had talked about uh, providing some direction to staff to take a further look at this. And I know the, uh, the clerk has some direction that she's prepared, and I wonder if we could read, have that read back and, and consider that before we take a vote on the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just asking her to put together directions <laughs> as you were speaking. Thank you. We're all on the same page. Yes. Madam Clerk. A direction to staff would be that council directs staff to report back following further consultation with the Grand River Conservation Authority, the Region of Waterloo, other munis Ontario municipalities, and include a draft framework for requests for the scattering of cremated human remains from city-owned land adjacent to waterways in the City of Cambridge for council's consideration. Councillor Liggett. Uh, yes, I would add the province in there because we, I, we may have uh, something to do with the bereavement. Um, I can't remember the name of the Ontario Bereavement uh, Organization. Yeah. Yes, Mike is shaking his head, yes. Sure. Nodding his head, yes, yeah. Thank you. And, and so I think the next uh, step is that if there are no questions, no further questions or comments from council, then we'll take a vote on the motion I'll just clarify that with Madam Clerk and then we would uh, provide that direction. Yes, so what we'll do is we'll vote on the motion and uh, the intent would be that uh, if the motion, following the motion, we would give that direction to staff. So Madam Clerk, I'll ask uh, if you would take the vote please. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Meta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. If count, if, oh, sorry. Thanks everyone. And then I think what we'll do is we'll just, so that it's on the record, we'll have the, the clerk read the direction that we, uh, that we are going to provide staff as a result of uh, this motion being uh, passed. Direction to staff that council directs staff to report back following further consultation with the Grand River Conservation Authority, the region of Waterloo, Ontario municipalities, 
the BOA and other ministries, the province of Ontario, and include a draft framework for requests for the scattering of cremated human remains from city-owned land adjacent to waterways in the city of Cambridge for council's consideration. I see some nodding of heads, so I think that's the uh, that's the direction that we wanted to provide. And Councillor Liggett, did you want to add something? Oh, okay, thank you. So we'll move on to the next item, and that's other business. And uh, today we have a motion under the other business as it relates to an item of correspondence from Energy Plus requesting council's endorsement of actions related to the board of directors in preparation for an upcoming annual shareholders meeting. And Councillor Adshade, you have the motion. Please read it in its entirety. I do, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, it's moved by myself and second one by Councillor Reed that council endorse that the tenure maximum term limitation be waived to permit Martin Champ to be eligible for one additional year as a director by the shareholders of the Cambridge and North Dunfries Energy Plus Incorporated at the annual shareholders meeting. And that council endorse the slate of directors for the upcoming year as recommended by the board of directors to be endorsed at the annual shareholders meeting as follows. Independent directors, Lynn Wooler, Martin Champ and Anita Davis, designated directors, Catherine McGarry, Susan Foxen and Ian Miles. And further that council endorsed as recommended by the board of directors that KPMG be appointed auditors to the Cambridge and North Dumfries Energy Plus Inc for 2021. Thank you, Councillor uh, Shade. Does Council have any questions? Yes, Councillor Liggett, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is more one of nosiness uh, because I have no knowledge of, of how they their inner workings are, uh, but I'm, I'm just nosy as to why they need to extend for another year. Somebody who's been on 10 years already, did they not have anybody adequate in the community to take on that role or is something going on that they need to have this person back again for an additional year? Oh, there, Mr. Calder, he knows the answer. I didn't think anybody would know the answer. No, Mr. Calder does know the answer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Calder, please. To you, Deputy Mayor, man, to uh, Councillor Leggett. Um, as you're well aware, there is a, uh, um, a merger being uh, looked at currently. And I think for the sake of, of consistency, um, they wanted to ensure that all members uh, were very familiar with the work that's been done, done uh, to date on that process. As you know, it's a very complex process. It's been going on for about, oh, 12, 13 months now. So they just wanted to ensure that uh, they didn't have to bring somebody up to speed and they could get through this process. Um, hence, they only extended it a year because they hope to have the deal worked out by, by then. Thank, Thank you. you. Alder, I, I, you know, I thought there'd be some sort of a, a, a good answer to that. I, you know, I, it seemed like an innocent motion, but at the same time, I thought there had to be some background to that. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, next is uh, Councillor Devine. Please go ahead. The question has been answered. Thank you. Thank you. And seeing no other questions, I'll now ask the clerk to call for the vote. Madam Clerk, please. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, does any member of council have other business for discussion? Then we'll move next to the notices of motion. And we do have a notice of motion from Councillor Hamilton, where notice was provided at our meeting of April 6, 2021. We also have four delegations this evening on this item. And our first delegation is Amy Fraser. We'll just take a moment to bring Amy online.
Sorry. Sorry, we're still trying to connect with Amy. We're moving on to the next delegation and we're trying to connect with Rebecca Hardy. So please bear with us. We were able to connect with Rebecca. Rebecca, it's uh, Councillor Mike Mann speaking. Are you there? I am here, yes. Thank you for joining us this evening. And just before we get started, I have some uh, uh, housekeeping rules to explain. Uh, just a reminder. Thanks. Just a reminder that you have five minutes to address Council this evening. Please ensure that your remarks relate directly to the agenda item you are speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your remarks. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure that your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking council any questions. A reminder to ensure your comments are directly related to the item you are speaking to. Uh, you do have five minutes and when four minutes are up, you'll hear a bell in the background and uh, you'll continue for a minute and at the conclusion of five minutes, council may have questions for you. And All right. Uh, you, uh, thank you. It's up to you. Thank you, Amy. Go ahead, please. Or, or okay. Rebecca, go ahead, please. That's okay. <laughs> uh, firstly, thank you very much for having me here this evening. Uh, good evening to Mr. Deputy Mayor and the councillors. Um, I'm one of the co-chair people of Moffat Creek uh, School Council, and I'm uh, present tonight asking for safe and accessible on-street parking on Myers Road near Moffat Creek Public School. Currently, I'm fortunate enough to work from home and I am able to walk my kids to and from school, but I'm also keenly aware that other caregivers working away from their home are not afforded this privilege and luxury. I realize I'm in the very lucky minority. As a bit of a background, uh, our family has always walked to and from school as much as possible. My boys enjoy and very much look forward to taking part in the school and the board wide walk to school days. And we fully support the other initiatives like Drive to Five and the Trailblazer program that our wonderful school principals have executed and promoted since the school opened. That being said, there is still the need for safe on-street parking on Myers Road, and I'd like to tell you some of the reasons why. In a non-pandemic year, I am volunteering inside Moffat Creek Public School almost daily, sometimes early before the first bell, for special events like our weekly pizza days, and sometimes late after the last bell, cleaning up after a school-wide celebration like a fun fair. Oftentimes, I'm carrying heavy loads of volunteer items from my vehicle to the school or vice versa. The need for safe on-street parking is a necessity for all of our numerous volunteers. Our strong, enthusiastic, generous, and passionate school council drives the school's fundraising efforts 
Our council and our many volunteers raise money to build our playgrounds, plant trees, and buy the many items needed for the classrooms on a daily basis. Our volunteers are often helping out at special events before they go to work or they come directly from work. And we need places for these amazing people to park safely on Myers Road. There is absolutely no room for our volunteers to park in the school parking lot. Currently, the parking lot at the front of the school is not large enough for the teachers, staff, and the wide daycare workers in a non-pandemic year. Our school is not operating at full capacity, even in a non-pandemic year. We have the room to add two more portables at the very least, even with the proposed expansion of the parking lot by 12 extra spaces, we would still have teachers, staff, and Y day care workers parking on Myers Road. They need street parking spots to park safely. It is not just our school council volunteers that need parking spots on Myers Road. We have many support and occasional staff at the school that also need parking consideration. Our ESL teachers and SLP teachers, speech and language pathologists, visit the school several times a week and need safe street parking. Our Strong Start volunteers who read with many children throughout the week need spots to park. Our wonderful lunchroom supervisors who are at the school twice a day most certainly need safe on-street parking of which both of them currently take advantage. Lastly, our school and our school council run many events throughout the year Meet the teacher barbecue nights, parent-teacher interview nights, fun fairs, book fairs, and so forth. And these events are attended by many members of the community. These events occur during and outside of school hours, and we need safe, accessible parking on Myers Road for our families to use. In short, I am asking for Council to consider our request that the upcoming plans for construction on Myers Road include safe, accessible parking spots near Moffat Creek Public School. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rebecca. And what we'll do now is we'll turn to council and see if there are any questions. And I do have some. Uh, Councillor Devine, please go ahead. Rebecca, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, Rebecca, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, a question, I mean, you certainly, uh, you, you laid it out pretty good between uh, you know the, the two schools. But I, I, as a counselor, I have a concern. Mm -hmm. um, what is the school themselves doing for parking on, parking on their own school property? Because this is not entirely a, a city responsibility or regional responsibility. There's responsibility here behalf, on behalf of the board. And I'm not convinced they're living up to their responsibility. Is there parking? Is there parking? in and around the schools that's available? Or are they taking a position that there's to be no parking or dropping off or picking up children on school property? Can you Absolutely. Tell me that? I'm sorry. I said, can you tell me that please? Absolutely, thank you for your question. Um, so we do have a parking lot at the front of our school. It is currently, um, currently not big enough to even house the um, staff working at the school, unfortunately. We also have a Y attached to our school, um, so it's not enough even for them in a non-pandemic year. But the school board has committed uh, most definitely to increasing the size of our front parking lot by 12 parking spaces. And this will hopefully help to mitigate some of the staff and the teachers having to park on the road in a non-pandemic year. So the board is working with us. There are preliminary plans that have not been approved um, by the region of a secondary parking lot that will be at the back of the, of the school property, but this will border on um, Dundas Road, Dund yeah, Dundas Street, uh, which we all know is a very busy thoroughfare and the region would have to sign off on approval of turning into and out of a parking lot at the back of our school. So that is still, um, still unknown at this point of time, but the board is working with us and we have a fantastic relationship with student transportation as well. Uh, and, and we have great contacts with the region and we're thankful that the city is also willing to work with us on this. Okay, so when they do the... Uh... If they do make the changes on Dundas Street, does that mean that school bus will be able to go in uh, off the street 
and uh, drop kids off and pick kids up? Or will it have to be all done on the street? I don't imagine that the school buses will actually be put at the back parking lot off of mm-hmm. Dundas Street. I think the school buses will still come to the front of the school. It's a fairly long walk from um, Dundas Street up to the school building. Again, uh, I don't think any plans have been cemented yet um, in terms of that. But to my understanding, the buses will remain at the front of the school and that extra parking at the back Um, There are talks about it perhaps being um, a parking lot where some kindergartners, uh, parents can do um, their pickup and drop off. Again, nothing is concrete, I'm sorry. Uh, That's fine. Rebecca, thank you so much for your presentation and all the hard work you do with the school to make this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Councillor Wolf, please go ahead. Um, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for your presentation. Um, in the plans to um, redo the road, do you know if they're going to be putting sidewalks on both sides of the road? I believe now there's only sidewalks on one side. Uh, that is correct. There are sidewalks on uh, on one side of the road, and there will be plans to have sidewalks on both sides of the road. That's my understanding. Okay. So... At least that's an improvement. Um, Thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Rebecca, I don't have any any further questions of you, but I do want to thank you for presenting tonight. And uh, I just see that Councillor Liggett has one that she wants to ask you. So please, if you just hang on, we'll get Councillor Liggett to ask her question. Councillor Liggett. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I'm always searching for the button to raise my hand. Um, Rebecca, the, the property for the school comes all the way to Dundas Street. And the, the um, school property at the back there is pretty vacant. Is there not room to put a parking lot back there and and ingress and egress? You know, most schools would just love to have that much space. So is that something that you guys have considered at in depth or just superficially or have you at all maybe? Absolutely, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, at the back of the school, I'm assuming that you're referencing Dundas Street at the back? Right. There, there are um, currently some plans in the work that the board has agreed to potentially give us a parking lot back there of, I believe, I don't know the exact number, I want to say 20 spots. Uh, but again, the region would have to um, work with us on that because it's a very busy road and the turning into and out of that parking lot would be very difficult. The other, um, the other problem that we have with our school is we are part of a wetlands um, Moffat Creek runs c- behind the school. So we are limited as to, we, we just can't put in a, a giant parking lot back there because there are some environmental questions. Um, so we would have to take those kind of things into consideration. And, um, but a- as far as I know, there is a parking lot plan for the back of the school if the region um, gives an okay on it, which they have not done yet. Okay, thank you. I, w- I would think that a uh, ingress similar to coming into Soper Park, where it's sort of a lane that comes off of Dundas and comes right in and there's no, it, it doesn't go further. It's only for that would work quite well if you're having those discussions with the region, but I can certainly understand the wetlands. Thank you. Thank you. I will, uh, I will bring forth the Soper Park suggestion if, uh, if I get the chance to. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Rebecca, I don't see any further questions, but I do want to thank you for being part of our delegation tonight. And uh, if you want to choose to stay and watch the rest of the meeting, you can at the City of Cambridge YouTube site. You're more than welcome to do that. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Good night. Our next delegation is Adriana Lee, and we'll take... And... uh, We'll just see if we can if we can get uh, the next delegation online. Just a moment, please.
So our first delegate has been able to join us and uh, that is Amy Fraser. And Amy is now with us. Amy, are you there? I am, yes. Hi, everybody. Thank My sincere apologies about that. Thank you, Amy. Before you get started, I just want to uh, give you some guidelines as to uh, how, we, how you present this evening. And uh, a reminder that you have five minutes to address council and please ensure that your remarks relate directly to the agenda item that you're speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your remarks. We also have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure that your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. And a reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item you're speaking to. Uh, you have five minutes and at the four minute mark, a bell will ring in the background just to warn you that you have a minute left. And at the conclusion of your presentation, uh, council may have questions of you. And I know you have a presentation and our, our, our clerk has uh, permitted you to share the screen. So uh, when you need the next slide changed, just ask for the next slide to be changed. That this is the only screen. I just wanted to put a map in front of everybody so that we could kind of get our bearings on what we're discussing here. So it may help some of answer some of those questions that uh, were asked of, of Becca there too. So thank, thank you, um, Amy. Okay, so thank you for having me. My name is Amy Fraser, and I'm a parent at the Moffat Creek School. I've been a parent at the school since it opened, as I have a 20 year old and a nine year old. So I was at one time a mom pushing the stroller down Branchton Road to take my youngest to the YMCA childcare. I soon became a driving mom as I found the walking conditions along Branchton Road to be horribly unsafe with its deep ditch. There's no sidewalks there and the heavy truck traffic. We are now a primarily a walking family again as we've graduated away from the stroller days and the toddler days. And so we walk to and from school with our nine-year-old on a daily basis. But we're here tonight and we're looking for the support from City Council for um, a, just a portion of street parking to be incorporated into the plans for the Myers Road reconstruction. If you have a look at that map, you're going to see that the, built, the school was built on a parcel of land that is isolated from the community that it serves. In essence, we feel like the school was built on an island. We have regional roads on all three sides and then the forest on the other. There are no side streets that immediately surround the school boundaries for parents to use or children to access, which then creates congestion at the front entrance. Our goal is and has been for basically eight years since the school opened, and I heard your questions about the parking lot at the back. That was my suggestion the year that school opened. So we've been working on that for eight years. Our goal is to disperse the current traffic to different points all around the school, thinning the traffic and creating a much more pleasant, less congested, and one might argue a safer way for everybody to access the school. Currently, there are about 80 vehicles that come for morning drop-offs and pickups, and then close to about 200 that come for our larger community events like Meet the Teacher Night, graduations, holiday concerts, science fair nights, kindergarten information nights, and so on. And then Becca spoke to the fact that in a non-pandemic year, you're also going to see the staff, our volunteers, and YMCA child care staff and parents that will use the street parking during the day. The street parking that we're requesting is currently legal parking that's being used right now. So right now, those 80 cars they cover the entire front of Myers Road all the way up and down. What we're requesting, you can see on the map there, is that just the portion from, um, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my notes. What's the name? Slater. So from the school boundary line to Slater on both sides, and then on the east side from the school boundary line to Branston Road. So again, our goal is to disperse the traffic. So we are in support of hopefully the region will approve the parking lot at the back. So that'll take a portion. So I'm hoping that that'll take a certain percentage of the vehicles to the back. Um, the region is going to provide a ramp coming from California down to Myers Road. So that'll draw some vehicle traffic up to West Point and McNichol. Um, and again, our goal is to disperse the traffic all around and thin it out so that it's a much safer way for our students to um, access the school. 
at some point, the road is going to be downloaded from a regional road to a city street. And I'm hoping that we can be forward thinking and design that now with this in mind. In conclusion, the reality is that despite all of our best efforts that we've made over the last eight years to encourage carpooling, walking, cycling, in support of all the initiatives that Leslie at Student Transportation has presented us with, like the Trailblazer program, the Drive to Five program, in reality, we cannot eliminate the vehicle traffic at the front entrance entirely. The cars are going to come and they're going to stop as close to that front door or the kindergarten area as they can get. I feel like we have a collective responsibility to design the road to accommodate those vehicles so that they have a designated safe place to pull their cars over out of the flow of traffic to safely deliver and pick up their children. <clears throat> We'd really like to see it as a, um, a lay-by style cutout with curbs. And again, it's just on the west side and on the east side, not in front of the school at all. Thank you very much for your consideration and thank you for your patience with my phone issue this evening. Thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you for displaying that map. That was very helpful. Uh, and questions for, of council, I do have one for you. Uh, Councillor Liggett, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Amy, I know the development at the corner of uh, Myers is uh, t a few, just a handful of townhouses. The other development, future development, that's uh, Dundas Street there. Um, do you know how large that is or maybe staff knows? I think it's still too early on. I think that the developer is still in the process of acquiring property. So I'm not sure if, if anybody will have an answer for that. Mr. Bromberg, do you know if we had any the indication of anything coming forward yet? That's for the future development at Dundas Street at the back of the school. I can't, at, at this point, I, I can't be certain what has been submitted or, or what hasn't been and whether it's just been um, discussions at this point. Okay, thank you. So, um, I, I guess, Amy, I, I was going to ask you a question of, based on the size of that development, whether there is a potential of um, a city road coming into the back of the property if you can't get regional support for uh, the parking lot yet. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, if we can get a parking lot coming up a city road uh, instead and landing on the school property if, if uh, you know, just for you to take forward as a potential uh, for future if the region turns you down. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. And our next question is from Councillor Wolf. Please go ahead. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Amy, um, I was curious about uh, the ramp from California. Um, I know my son used to live on California and I used to walk my granddaughter down that steep hill to the school. What do you mean by a ramp? Like, um, is that so? It'll, it's going to be a pedestrian walkway, and because well, then you're very familiar with the significant yes. elevation change there. So the um, the footpath will come down from California, and because of the grade, it's going to almost approach the plaza before they'll reach the ground level there, um, and then there will be a pedestrian crossing. So, so that's going to help disperse some of the traffic because some parents will be able to park on McNichol because you'll be familiar then with the little yeah. footpath that's there that connects West Point to McNichol. What we don't want is any vehicles using California. So um, this is, you know, I'm, we're, we're maybe getting a little off topic, but we're going to propose some kind of a uh, way to stop the traffic at the corner of West Point and Summerside and make that hopefully California just ped pedestrian friendly for our students. Okay, thank but you. This was our way of trying to connect the community to the school. Yes, your comments about it being an island um, were a good description because with that big hill and then the, the um, regional roads, it, it doesn't have the access that most schools do. That's right. Thank you. And 
Amy, thank you for your delegation this evening. Uh, you're welcome to stay and watch the rest of the meeting on the Cambridge City of Cambridge YouTube site if you wish. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move next to uh, our next delegation. And that is Adriana Lee. And we'll just take a moment to connect with Adriana. Hello, Adriana. Yes, hello. Good evening. It's uh, Councillor Mike Mann. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. Before we get started, I just have some guidelines that I want to explain. Uh, so as a reminder, you have five minutes to address council tonight. Please ensure that your remarks relate directly to the agenda item that you're speaking to. Otherwise, we may ask that you end your remarks. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking council any questions. A reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item you're speaking to. You'll have five minutes to speak and at four minutes a, 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 a warning bell will go off in the background and you'll be able to finish up and then that'll be followed by questions from council. So uh, it's, it's yours to continue, Adriana, please go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, as mentioned, my name is Adriana, and I am a parent with three children, one currently in junior kindergarten at Moffat Creek. Because of the Waterloo Region School Board policy geared towards keeping kindergartners safe, parents are required to physically hand their kindergartners to the kindergarten teachers. Every morning at Moffat Creek, there are three, and in a non-pandemic non year, four kindergarten classes worth of parents dropping off their children, uh, we call them their kindies, off at school, plus supply teachers, volunteers, and daycare drop-offs because our school is attached to a Y, all requiring parking. Now, because of my work schedule, I am not able to walk to school every day with my kids, which means I bring all my children in the car with me when I'm dropping them off. I am one of countless parents who has a child in kindergarten and has younger children who are in a five-point harness, which is for toddlers, or in a bucket seat, which is for babies. We need to have the ability to park so that we can unload our strollers and unload our children. Now, I absolutely support walking to school, and on the days that my schedule allows, I walk my children to school. But on days that I work, I have to be able to park my car somewhere close to the school to make sure that I can get my kindergartner safely in the hands of her teacher and making sure that my other children get to where they need to be in a timely manner. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you, Adriana. And I'll turn to council to see if there are any questions for you. And I don't see any, so thank you for joining us as a delegation this evening. You're welcome to continue watching the rest of the meeting on the City of Cambridge YouTube site. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next delegation is Arpa Jabernian. And we'll just get staff to bring. Hello. Hello, Arpa. Yes. Can you just turn the background noise down? Uh, I've been falling all night. It is down. Yes. Thanks very much. Of it's course. A, Councillor Mike Mann, and I want to thank you for joining us this evening. And just before you get started, I have a couple of ground rules that I need to explain. Okay. Uh, you have five minutes to address council this evening. And we please ensure that your remarks relate directly to the agenda item that you're speaking to. Otherwise, we may have to end your comments. We do have rules of engagement in council meetings and ask that you ensure that your remarks are respectful and that you refrain from asking questions of council. And the reminder to ensure that your comments are directly related to the item you are speaking to. I will advise when your five minutes are up, at which time council may have questions for you. And at the four minute mark, you will hear a warning bell in the background. So thanks again for joining us this evening and uh, you have five minutes. Thank you. Again, good evening, Deputy Mayor and members of Council. I want to start off by thanking you for giving me this opportunity to share my story tonight and for your patience this evening. It sounds like it's been a long one. Uh, just to give you some background information, I was born in Cambridge and raised right off of Myers Road, and I currently live 
uh, off the island, uh, so just off of, uh, off of Branchton Road. I am now the mom who's pushing the stroller on her walk to school, like Amy had mentioned, as she was 10 years ago. I know all too well the reality and complications of the unsafe conditions for pedestrians on Myers Road. I am also a teacher with the Barley Region District School Board and see daily the amount of students that get dropped off and picked up at school on any given day, despite all of the walk to school initiatives that take place. However, I come to you tonight to speak specifically as a concerned parent who has a child in the French Immersion Program at Moffat Creek Public School and as someone who has an elderly mother who helps out part-time with picking up my child after school. There is a false assumption that children are traveling to and from school daily from the address that they are registered with in the school board. I believe it is a mistake to assume that children are either bus students or walkers based on their primary address. There are three specific situations where this does not allow for the consideration of our students coming or going to school from a distance. These include children from out of boundary who come to school for French immersion, children who come from two home families where one family member resides in a residence that's out of boundary, or for our before and after school care providers who are oftentimes grandparents that are dropping off and picking up their grandchildren from school, but tend to live out of the catchment area. We also have our students who are athletes and are might be coming to school directly from the arena in the morning. Maybe this is something that contributes to the traffic flow issues felt at all schools, but I'm hoping that together we can come up with a solution for the safety of all. I'd like to share a few more details in regards to these uh, three, four specific points. Our school has many students who are part of the French Immersion Program. And this program allows for students to attend our school from out of boundaries. Since taking the school bus is not an option provided for French Immersion students, parents and caregivers are then required to drive their children to school. We ask that you take into consideration the situations of these parents who have no other means of getting their children to school than by driving them. Also, our grandparents are an essential part of, uh, and other caregivers are an essential part of the lives of so many families. Uh, these grandparents often step up to help care for school age children before and after school. They do have to drive to pick up and drop off their grandchildren before and after school, since they don't typically live within school boundaries. Most days I drive home from school, from work, to school, park my car in the driveway, and then make a quick race to school before the bell rings to pick up my son. But twice a week, I'm one of the fortunate people who have my mother pick up my son and drive him home from school. She lives a distance away, so she would have to drive to school, park, pick him up, and then drive him back home. We ask that you consider the situation of our grandparents, our parents, who are helping out with our uh, pickup drop-off situations and provide safe parking for them on Myers Road as well. Finally, like all schools, we have students who live between two homes as parents share custody. Typically, both parents don't live within the same school boundary, meaning that one parent lives far enough to have to drive. These parents who are driving to drop off and pick up their children from a considerable considerable distance do not have any other choice than to drive their kids to school and then require some sort of safe parking. We at Moffat Creek even have a parent coming as far as Burlington to drop off his two children at school. Parents such as this one would be left with nowhere else to park close to the school if there wasn't an option for safe parking on Myers Road. I don't know what the best solution is to make everyone satisfied, but I do know the safety of our students and all the pedestrians should come first. I hope that some of these points made it clear that there is no way to bring street parking down to absolutely zero and that there really do, does need to be a place for the cars to safely pull over and park on Myers Road. I know I'm ready and willing to do whatever needs to be done to make this a reality. I just need the direction of how to proceed. I really do thank you all for your time this evening and I welcome any questions that I may hopefully be able to answer for you. Thank you. Thank you, Arpa, and I'll just ask Council if there are any questions of you this evening. And seeing one, I have Councillor Adshade, please. Go ahead, Councillor Adshade. Thanks, Deputy Mayor, and uh, thanks for the presentation. Just roughly, how many uh, safe parking spots are, is there parking spots at all on Myers Row right now? Is there any safe parking spots, or how many cars could fit in there? 
So from what I noticed on my walks to school, during school drop-off and pickup hours that would take place, in front of the school on both the left and so- or right side of the lane, there is absolutely no parking that is permitted. Um, on both ends where we are, uh, based on Amy's map, where you see where we're requesting there to be parking spots directly on Myers, those are the only spots on Myers Road, to my recollection, that cars are actually allowed to be parking. Now, at any given time, if you do go, there are, during drop-off and pickup times, there are cars on both sides of Myers Road, uh, unfortunately disregarding the signs that say don't park here because there are no other alternatives. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ARPA. Of course, my pleasure. And seeing no further questions, I do want to thank you for your delegation tonight. And you're more than welcome to watch the remainder of the meeting at the City of Cambridge YouTube channel, if you like. I will. I appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Now, Councillor Hamilton, I think you have the motion for this uh, item on the agenda. Would you please read it in its entirety? Thank you to you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Mann. It is uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Adshade. Um, Whereas there have been ongoing problems for more than nine years concerning safe pedestrian crossings at Holy Spirit School and insufficient parking spaces provided for parents at their children at Moffat Creek Public School at Myers Road, I'm being Zoom bombed by my toddler. So, okay. <laughs> You're going to help me read a motion, okay? Can you grab them? Uh, whereas, despite more than 80 cars now parking on Myers Road twice daily to get their children to school, Regional Waterloo is planning to rebuild Myers Road with no parking spaces whatsoever, oh, resulting in... Go see mom. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, resulting in, twice a day, cars parking on distant hey, residential streets. I'll be done in a sec. Okay? Okay. Go see mom. <laughs> Welcome to the world of Zoom. Here, do you want to sit with me while I read this? Okay. Let me rephrase that. Go right there. Resulting in twice a day, cars parking on distant residential streets and making parents with young children walk in potentially adverse conditions. Whereas Cambridge and Waterloo Region face an acute need for parking on this road at this specific location and a general and increasing need for parking as this area of the city, Southeast Galt, grows and intensifies substantially. There it be resolved that Cambridge Council request Regional Council to direct regional staff to work in consultation with parents and residents of Cambridge to evaluate options for parking spaces on Myers Road at Moffat Creek Public School, and that correspondence be sent on behalf of Cambridge Council requesting Regional Council to consider that parking on Myers Road is essential for the overall safety and well-being of its parents, children, and residents of today and the future. Uh, and if, if we may speak to the motion, very quickly. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, go see mom, okay? All right, good job, dude. Sorry about that. They just arrived home from Nona's house, so the timing was great. Um, As you know, I'm almost six months in on the job. Um, It will be six months as of uh, really two days from now. And when I was knocking on doors uh, in Ward 7, you saw that map that Amy had. I knocked on every single door. And despite the issues we hear about in Cambridge, and we hear about a lot of them, um, in this area, this was by far the number one issue. It was traffic issues at Holy Spirit School uh, and parking at Moffat Creek. Um, So it's just been uh, an ongoing kind of wave of uh, parents contacting me, concerned residents contacting me with parking on their street. Um, the, The issue is that the region is now redesigning the road. It is a regional road. Um, and when I first uh, joined council, uh, I inquired with the region, um, well, why don't we have more parking uh, in front of Moffat Creek? Why don't we have uh, more safety protocols in front of Holy Spirit? Um, and if anyone has ever been there at this, uh, I think it was, it could have been Amy or Becca that was discussing the amount of cars that appear in front of Moffat Creek. On average, uh, when I've gone, I've seen between 70 and about 85 cars that are parked on the street because there's nowhere else to go. Um, the region, the school board and the city have been working together because this seems to be just an historical kind of mix or confluence of how not to design parking for a school. And I think it's, it, it will serve as a textbook case for years to come with essentially what not to do. And I think every single actor has, has admitted that. So the current 
um, plans um, are that in the front space, if you remember that map that Amy had, they were going to add 12 more spaces, uh, which should accommodate some of the staff and volunteers. And there's tentative plans to build a back parking lot, which was going to be 22 spaces. So it, that would be about, let's say, 34 spaces, give or take. So with recent meetings with the region, um, there have been potential discussions to maybe add slightly more uh, parking spaces onto the, the back lot off of Dundas, um, and also potentially add a kiss and ride on the front. So have buses on Myers and potentially uh, facilitate kind of a more active flow of, of parents dropping their kids off. So the question remains, well, what happens with the extra, let's say 50 to 60 cars? Because it's only gonna compensate between 30 and 40 cars that are appearing at the school. Um, and at first the, the response was, well, we can't have parking on Myers because it's just too busy. It's, uh, it's 4,000 cars a day, right? And, I was told that's, that seems like a lot, but up the street at Holy Spirit, it was impossible to enact further traffic calming measures because 4,000 cars isn't a lot. So I decided to ask, okay, how many schools do we have in Cambridge that have more than 4,000 cars a day on their streets uh, and have parking in front? It turns out there, and I'd just like to read these quickly, there are actually seven schools in Cambridge that have more than 4,000 cars a day and parking. Uh, almost immediately in front. Uh, so St. Margaret Catholic School on Saginaw, uh, daily traffic is 8,300. Clemens Mills, 5,700. St. Teresa Catholic, 4,800. Saginaw Public School, 4,800. On Concession Road, uh, St. Michael's Catholic School has 12,100 per day. Uh, Concession Road, north of Langs Drive. Coronation Public School has 11,000 cars a day. Uh, Elgin Street North has uh, Elgin Street Public School, which is 5,600 cars a day. And placed in between all those, you have community centers, you have churches, uh, you have a variety of, of different groups. So it taught me well, there, there is the capacity or the potential to at least put parking in front of a facility like this if uh, at a place like St. Michael's, you have 12,100 cars a day um, compared to 4,000 on Myers. Um, one of the issues is that, of course, there's parking on other regional roads. We know them all, whether it's Ainsley or Water, um, there are a few. Um, one of the issues that I think we have to face as a city is if those 50 cars do end up being um, pushed off onto residential streets, which is part of the potential regional plan is to have those excess 50 cars move to residential streets, to park on residential streets and have their children walk in those residents haven't been consulted. And if I were a resident that all of a sudden lived in a quiet, calm cul-de-sac and then twice a day had uh, essentially a parking area of kids, um, most of these streets also have no sidewalks, I'd be fairly upset. And right now that's one of the main kind of plans. If there's no parking placed on Myers Road, um, that's where a lot of the traffic will go. Um, I think the tentative plan is to enact what's called behavioral change instead of putting parking again on Myers, the plan is to enact curbs and increase bylaw and ticketing. This is to facilitate behavioral change so that people will get the hint, you're not supposed to park on Myers, you're supposed to walk elsewhere and, and walk in. Um, and I think that's quite a dangerous move um, to essentially put up curbs and ticket parents for trying to drop their kids off uh, in front of their school. First of all, because it's, it's a parent just trying to do what's right. Sometimes you can't walk to school, you have to drive as many of the delegates uh, informed us. And also because I think a lot of people will simply, I've uh, seen in other schools, be quite upset. We'll end up, hey, you wanna join again? <laughs> it's, a, it's a busy night here. <laughs> They'll end up essentially stopping their cars in front of schools and creating a dangerous situation, right? Well, that create a dangerous situation. Most importantly, I think, um, if we're thinking 10 years ahead, this is a regional road right now, but it could be <laughs> it could be a city road in about 10 years because we have the completion of the south boundary road and also the east boundary road. Um, so what I'm uh, essentially asking, um, and I can, I'm happy to answer questions about any, any of this because parking space on Myers right now, we see the incredible densification of the area. We're gonna see the need for the spaces. We see it's isolated geographically. Um, I'm absolutely not opposed to active transportation, but because of the strange kind of locale of Moffat Creek. Um, you know, I, I've listened to the regional side, I've listened to uh, residents, and I really do think that parents are onto something here. I think they deserve a safe spot to park <laughs> and drive their kids. We need some scissors. 
Um, so in short, I think with this motion, what I'd like to do, because it is a regional road, is to act as a unified council to send a message to the region that, yes, we have to pay more attention. It's an antique. We have to pay more attention uh, to what parents of Cambridge are actually saying. Um, there's a lot of talk about quantitative traffic flows and models and top-down kind of bird's eye views of a schematic of the area. Uh, but as counselors, we engage with people. We knock on doors. We hear their stories. I've met parents pushing their strollers. I've been out there multiple times, uh, and I've heard the anxiety in their face. Uh, so I've heard the anxiety in their voice. I've seen kind of the angst in their face, and I've just heard constant demands from everyone, from teachers to firefighters to nurses, saying, we've parked here for X number of years. We just want to continue to do this, but just make it safer, make it more convenient because we've seen it being done elsewhere and we'd like to continue doing it here. So the first is just to act as a unified voice to the region to say, please listen to Cambridge residents, please listen to these parents, because right now I don't think their voice is being heard well enough. Um, and also to send a message to residents that Cambridge Council, we are listening. We are hearing their voices and we're doing as much as we possibly can to try and facilitate uh, their wishes for the area. And I know as, as councillors, we do get some emails and requests that might be somewhat difficult to fulfill or to accomplish. Um, this one, I've received a greater number of emails and comments about this than anything else. And the more I look into it, the more I see that there is a very strong case here. And so uh, I'm emphatically 100% behind the parents of, of Ward 7 and Moffat Creek on this one. And that's the voice that I hope council will also send to the region is that we're listening to our residents and we're listening to our parents and what's best for them and then right now in the future. Um, you have anything else to add? The washing machine. He, he sees the washing machine. So, you know, I'm going to finish it with that and say if there's any questions that I can help answer, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'll, I will leave it that. So, I'm going to put this on mute. That's okay. Thanks, Councillor Hamilton. And uh, I know there were some questions. There was a question from Councillor Devine. And Councillor Devine, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. A couple of comments. Thank you so much for the speech and the lecture about school parking. Um, this is not the only school we have an issue with in the city of Cambridge. It is not. Okay, so let's not have illusions that this one is special. But we, uh, the, the motion you wrote is a good motion, but we are letting both school boards directly off the hook. We are taking responsibility once again, once again, for parking for the schools at the taxpayer's expense. Now, the school, both school boards get a share, a good share of taxes from the, uh, the ratepayers. And we're, we're taking this all right on the region of the city's back. I don't see anything in this motion that I can see that refers to any discussion uh, or any discussion whatsoever with either one of the boards. And so I, I you know, and I, I'd love to get down, uh, walk down this road hand in hand, but I think it's just a little bit, um, I, I, this, the school boards need some responsibility here. We ought not to be taking this solely on the backs of the taxpayers of the city, the ratepayers that pay for the city, the city roads and, and the region. Uh, there, there's a responsibility here on behalf of uh, the school boards. They did They did the designs, they designed the property. These, these schools are not old schools, not old by any stretch of the imagination. So is the board gonna come to the pump? I, I think they need to, come to, need to come to the pump as well. Thank you. Thank you. And before I go back to Councillor Hamilton, I'm gonna to go to Councillor Liggett first. Councillor Liggett, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you, you know, we have over, almost seven years of me being on council, repeatedly talked about the lack of parking at schools. Councillor Devine is 100% right. And, and Moffat Creek has been right up there at the top of it. Councillor Montero was always tearing his hair out over, over the parking there. And he did his best to try to alleviate the um, situation to no avail. And it has always been because the Board of Education has never taken that responsibility. Uh, so I'd like to see Councillor Hamilton amend this motion to add in something about the school boards uh, um, uh, doing something here and being part of that conversation. 
um, so that this could be supported um, by all of us. Thank you. And what I'll do is I'll turn now to Councillor Hamilton, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor Mann, and, and thank you very much, Councillor Devine, Councillor Ziggett, uh, for the questions, which which I agree with entirely. Um, I know this issue has probably cropped up before I joined council, um, as Councillor Liggett mentioned. And right now, and I'll tip my hat in many ways to the school board and to the region, because there are ongoing conversations. And there have been, uh, I think, concessions by all parties. Um, so the school board granting a larger parking space in the front, potential parking lot in the back, potentially expanding that. And now there have been recent conversations in terms of changing the front lot to maybe a kiss and ride. Um, which would also, you know, facilitate some of the uh, some of the, the required changes. Um, so this needs to be a multi-pronged solution. So those actors are at the table, and I think there is a, a good dialogue and a good exchange. Um, the biggest kind of shoe that hasn't dropped is the parking on Myers Road, because the whole road is being redone, right, from uh, from water all the way down to Branchton, um, and that is where we're essentially getting no budge, even though there's what I think and what I think parents tend to agree with. Are, are a lot of space for parking. Um, so to Councillor Devine's point, absolutely, the school board needs to come to the table. Um, I think the region does as well. Um, and that's what I think we're pushing for. And with Councillor Leggett's motion, I'm happy to add the school board in uh, as well. I think that's that's absolutely an important actor that needs to be brought to the table. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, hey dude, it's okay. Everyone just came home from Nona's house at the perfect time. Um, but they are, they are right now, um, they are in discussions. I think one of the biggest issues is everyone has been saying, everyone else is passing the buck, everyone else is passing the buck. And in a way, like if we let, uh, let's put history aside for a sec and just say, right now we have a tremendous problem of 80 cars parking on the road and creating a dangerous situation uh, for students, for staff, for parents. What I see is parents that need to get their kids to school and a road that right now is a regional road that will likely become a city road in the future. So I'd like to advocate the region as strongly as possible. It's ultimately, it's their road, it's in their hands, but to work with us as much as they are possibly willing to so that when that road likely becomes a city road, that it is amenable to the concerns of Cambridge residents. And we have, we've had a say, parents have had a say, it's not necessarily designed and crafted um, elsewhere based purely on schematics and quantitative metrics that don't take those concerns of parents in mind. Um, so Councillor Devine, like I agree with you for sure. The school board needs to come to the table and in a way they are. The region needs to come to a table in a way they are, uh, but not fully. And so now as I think the road's being redesigned, we just have to stop passing the buck and say, we need spaces. Um, the road will change hands. It's going to be fluid. And I'm very happy to amend the motion to add cooperating with the school board um, if Councillor Liggett um, uh, wishes that, that's fine. And, um, and I hope Councillor Devine enjoyed my lecture. I could, it's on YouTube, so I can send you the MP3 if you want. Thanks, Councillor Hamilton. And we'll move off to uh, Councillor Wolf, please. Go ahead. Uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, I fully support this motion. Um, I was one of the grandparents, the walking kindergarten children. <laughs> to down the hill from California and across the road. And I've also done quite a bit of supply teaching at Moffat Creek. When they first built the school, the parking lot had plenty of spaces actually, but the problem was that the school wouldn't allow parents to drive into the parking lot to do the kiss and ride. Now the school is bigger. So obviously um, between staff and volunteers, there aren't enough spaces. So um, Councillor, Hamilton is correct, and so as, as are the parents that spoke tonight, that the region has to cooperate with the road. Right now, um, they, we often get a police um, sort of splurge in there where everybody suddenly gets a ticket uh, that is parking to drop off their kids um, in the area right in front of the school where it says no parking. So. Um, I would like to see more than just the two areas that you designated for parking. And even if they said parking is allowed during those drop-off times, 
um, it might help. So um, I think the um, region has to come to the table, as, as said. And the other thing, if they're redesigning the road, I would also like to see them put a 40 kilometer zone there. Um, it's 50 kilometers right in front of a school where you have children crossing that road. Um, and it is a dangerous spot. Thank you, Councillor Wolf. And what we want to do is just bring this back to what it really is. It's correspondence on behalf of City Council that we want to send to the region. So I'll go to Councillor Devine next. This will be your second time, Councillor Devine. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you to the Chair. I'm aware it's my second time. Councillor Wolf is right, what she's saying. And I don't need an MP3 player, an MP3 disc. Uh, but one thing we have to recognize, this is not... I mean, this is inherent throughout the community. It's not just here. Um, I, I, I really do not believe the board has come into the pump in most situations. They they fluff it off again, you know, like, you know, you brought up, you'll put in the school boards in the motion. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure how serious we're, we're taking this because the, uh, and yes, that road would be a regional road and someday it'll be a city road. But you know, if we get amalgamated down the road, it's still gonna be a regional road, isn't it? So we have to do the right thing on that road for the residents, but we have to make sure there's proper access points to get into these schools and get out of the schools. We have to, we have to make sure that's done. And as long as the board's not living up to their, their end of the, end of the um, equation and we're taking all the responsibility, um, then I think we're gonna have bigger problems. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Devine. And, uh, not seeing any more questions, I am going to call, uh, ask the clerk to call the vote on this motion. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you call the, the vote, please? Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Nay. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item is a motion to receive correspondence and presentations. And the following motion is related to items of correspondence and presentations at council. And Councillor Radshade, you have the motion. Please read it in its entirety. I do. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. It's moved by myself, second by Councillor Wolf. And all presentations and correspondence from the Meeting be received. Thank you. Did it? Was everybody able to hear that? Okay. Thank you. There was a little bit of breakage there. Uh, does council have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call for the vote. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. Our next item is the confirmatory bylaw. Councillor Wolf, you have that motion. Would you please read it in its entirety? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Ameta, recommendation 21-28, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Cambridge at its meeting held on the 13th of April, 2021. And any questions or comments from Council? And seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call for the vote. Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Mehta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. And we have now reached the end of our agenda for today. 
Councillor Devine, you have the motion for our close of meeting. Please read it in its entirety. Uh, the special council meeting does now adjourn at 9.32 p.m. Seconded by Councillor Reed. Thank you, Councillor Devine. And I'll now ask for the clerk to call for the vote, Madam Clerk. Councillor Adshade. In favor. Councillor Devine. Aye. Councillor Ermetta. In favor. Councillor Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Liggett. In favor. Councillor Reed. In favor. Councillor Wolf. In favor. Deputy Mayor Mann. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. That concludes our meeting for tonight. Thank you for joining us. And on behalf of Council, we remind you, Cambridge, please be careful, be kind to one another, and please.